Good afternoon and uh, welcome everybody uh, to our oversight hearing. I'm happy to be co-chairing this hearing. Well, my name is Barry Gredenchik. I have the honor of being the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee for this term of the City Council. I have been joined by uh, my co-chair for today, and I want a full disclosure, I'm also a member of your subcommittee, so I have to be careful here. Uh, yes, um, Ms. Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx, who is the chair of the subcommittee on capital budget. We've also been joined by my colleague from Queens, Peter Koo, Mr. Andrew Cohn, fr uh, Andrew Cohn from the Bronx, Andrew King, uh, Andy King from the Bronx, Justin Brannan from the Great Borough of Brooklyn, and we will introduce, oh, and Mr. Matteo, Steve Matteo from Staten Island. Um, this afternoon, uh, we're gonna learn more about the Parks and Recreation budget and how it addresses the needs of all New Yorkers. Uh, first, the committee will review the Parks Department proposed budget for fiscal year 19 and its 2018 to 2022 capital commitment plan in the relevant section of the mayor's preliminary, uh, the preliminary mayor's management report for fiscal year 18. Uh, we'll also, of course, hear from our commissioner today. I'm so happy that uh, Commissioner Silva with, it, with us. Uh, the department's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget totals $502 million with 4,321 positions. This is an increase of 46 positions when compared to the same period last year. The budget includes a very modest new needs package of $6.2 million for fiscal year 2019, most of which is baseline for headcount positions to support the agency. These positions are mostly stationary engineers and phase one staffing for the community parks initiative. The agency's budget is mostly supported by city funds, but also relies on intra-city funding for its pop maintenance program, as well as capital IFA funding for the capital division. Even though the agency receives a small amount of federal funding, the committee is interested in the agency's contingency plans for potential federal funding cuts. As the city experiences substantial increase in parks usage, the department has unfortunately not been able to keep pace. There are now nearly 9 million New Yorkers, I guess it's about 8.6 million now, who rely on our city parks, and the committee would like to know what the department plans to do to address these issues, as well as an update on the committee's new needs that were added to the FY19 preliminary budget. Currently, the Parks Committee, uh, Parks budget as proposed by the administration is down to just 0.58% of the total city budget, with a drop in dollar terms of $30 million. For a fourth year in a row, the mayor's budget fails to baseline $9.7 million for critical maintenance workers, which would lead to a loss of 50 gardeners and 100 city parks workers who would be laid off as of June 30th, depriving our parks of sorely needed staffing and depriving 150 hardworking New Yorkers of their livelihoods. Over to the capital side, on, under Commissioner Silva, the department has launched three vital new capital initiatives that have done much to advance equity and access in our park system. I am interested in learning more about the work that was done in regards to Anchor Parks, the Community Parks Initiative, which we heard last month, and Parks Without Borders, which I saw a beautiful example of uh, at Lions Square Park uh, this past week when Commissioner Silver and I, along with uh, Ra Rafael Salamanca, cut the budget, cut the, cut the ribbon, not the budget, uh, on, on that park. In addition to that, the department has had some success with regard to their capital commitment rate, and, I'm sure that my colleague, Ms. Gibson, is going to be asking a lot of questions about that. Um, I would like to welcome, again, and thank Commissioner Silver and his team for their work that they are doing here uh, and around the city of New York. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, the chair of the Capital Subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you so much to Chair Councilmember Barry Gredenchek and congratulations on becoming our Chair of the Parks Committee and welcome to your first hearing in this new capacity budget. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. It's good to see everyone. I'm Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and I'm proud to serve as the chair of the newly formed Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I am grateful to the speaker for the honor and privilege to serve in this capacity and want to thank my co-chair and the members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation um, for holding this hearing today. This afternoon, on the last day of our fiscal 2019 preliminary budget, we started earlier this 
this month, but we save the best for last. We will be hearing from the Department of Parks and Recreation. I want to thank Commissioner Mitchell Silver for being here, and I look forward to your testimony this afternoon. Uh, the park's preliminary capital budget totals $1.9 billion in fiscal 2019 through fiscal 2022, representing about 4% of the city's total capital budget. Park's fiscal 2019 preliminary capital commitment plan includes $4.1 billion in fiscal 2018 through 2022, which is 21% more than the $3.4 billion scheduled in the adopted capital commitment plan. The majority of the capital projects span multiple fiscal years, and it is therefore common practice for many agencies to roll unspent capital funds into future fiscal years. In fiscal 2017, the Department of Parks and Recreation committed $586 million, which is about 60% of its annual capital plan. Therefore, it is assumed that a significant portion of the agency's fiscal 2018 capital plan will be rolled into fiscal 2019, thus increasing the size of the fiscal 2019 through 2022 capital plan. Through the work of our subcommittee, even though we're in our infancy, um, but beginning with today's hearing, I certainly want to focus on the timely and efficient delivery of parks capital projects for all New Yorkers. Our parks are the cornerstones and the hubs of our communities, and our constituents depend on them for recreation, for fresh air, health and wellness, exercise, everything you can think of, just to get a break from life. Um, unfortunately, it has been a practice over the years um, that many of the Parks capital projects have been notoriously slow and very expensive. Um, I do recognize a lot of progress has been made, and I want to commend our commissioner for his commitment to that. Part of the reason that I am here this afternoon is because I am confident that we can and will work together to come up with creative and innovative solutions to improve this process. We're going to speed things along and provide New Yorkers with a higher level of service because that's what they deserve. So I look forward to hearing from our commissioner about these and other issues, and I certainly want to recognize the finance staff who helped prepare today's hearing, our finance director, Latanya McKinney, our deputy directors, Nathan Told and Regina Parada ryan our unit head, Chima Obichair, our analyst, Kenny Grace, and our counsel, Rebecca Chasen, and the members of my subcommittee, our minority leader, Steve Matteo, and our chair, Barry Gridencheck, and I personally, as I close, Commissioner, want to thank you. And of course, I have to acknowledge my amazing Bronx Borough Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, who have been amazing. Uh, we've opened so many parks, and I am so thankful for that. Almost three years ago, we opened the High Bridge, the oldest standing bridge in the entire city of New York to thousands of residents. And if anyone has not had an opportunity, the High Bridge connects High Bridge Bronx to Northern Manhattan in Northern Manhattan. And it's 1,400 steps. And it's a beautiful bridge, and I look at it every day because it's in my district, and I'm so thankful. It was closed for 50 years, but this administration reopened it. So I personally want to thank you for that, and also have to acknowledge that last Thursday, all of my wonderful colleagues unanimously voted on the Jerome Neighborhood Rezoning Plan, which is about $189 million of capital investments, and within that, $60 million for you for parks, and that includes Grant Park, it includes Corporal Fisher, Aqueduct Walk, Bridge Playground, it includes Morton Playground, and I could not be more proud. And now what I want to make sure I can do is get these projects started before I leave office so that I want to make sure that we all take collective credit for opening these beautiful parks. But once again, I thank you for your work and look forward to today's hearing. And now I turn this back over to my colleague and chair, Barry Gridencheck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Born in the Bronx. Born in the Bronx, yeah. full disclosure. Full disclosure. And before Commissioner uh, Rodriguez Rosa was the wonderful Parks Commissioner of the Bronx, she was the wonderful Director of Recreation in the Borough of Queens. So, she came home. Well, we, had a, we gave her an education and we sent her to the Bronx. So. Um, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Uh, I do want to acknowledge a few more people. Uh, my legislative counsel, Christopher Sartori, 
uh, Patrick Mulvihill, the policy analyst, my own team, uh, my chief of staff, Ari Gershman, my counsel, Steve Bihar, and my deputy chief of staff, and more importantly, uh, my budget guy, uh, Dev Awasti, who will be leaving me at the end of June to go to law school at the University of Connecticut. So um, well, he's going to study Park's Law, right? Okay. <laughs> There's such a thing. Well, now, uh, Mr. Counsel, if you would swear in the panel, we can begin. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Well, I heard you say that today was the last day of the budget hearing, so I didn't know that. We could have scheduled this for tomorrow. <laughs> but since I'm here today, I will continue. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Gredenjic, members of the Parks Committee, Chair Gibson, and members of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget, and other members of the City Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined here today by a number of senior staff, including First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh, Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Therese Braddock, and Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the agency's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. In 2014, on my 16th day at the job, I had an opportunity to testify before the City Council for the first time. At that hearing to discuss the executive budget for fiscal year 2015, I pledged to the City Council then and I would work tirelessly to build a 21st century park system for New York City with a strong commitment to transparency, innovation and equity. And I'm extraordinarily proud that New York City Parks has made great strides toward those goals over the past four years and continues to fulfill that commitment. I'd like to begin by outlining some key facts and figures that help illustrate the scale and diversity of what we do at New York City Parks. We are the steward of over 30,000 acres, 14% of New York City's landmass, including 10,000 acres of natural areas. We oversee nearly 45 individual properties, ranging from playgrounds and parks to community gardens and green streets. At parks, we like to call ourselves the agency of fun, health, and happiness. But we take our work seriously because parks are vital to the quality of life for New Yorkers, whether it's a child playing at Imagination Playground in Brooklyn, seniors enjoying Tai Chi class at Greenpoint, Greenbelt Recreation Center on Staten Island, sun worshipers soaking in the sights and sounds of Orchard Beach in the Bronx, or nature buffs relishing the quiet peace that they can find in the natural areas of Ali, uh, Ali Pond Park in Queens. Our city's green and open spaces help New Yorkers lead happier, healthier lives. For many of us, our parks serve as our front yard, our backyard, our vacation destination. So it is our responsibility to create and sustain thriving parks and public spaces for New Yorkers of all ages and all walks of life. I'm pleased to be here today to report on the progress we have made in the first term of this administration and our goals for the years ahead. I have made it my number one priority as Parks Commissioner to look closely at the agency's process for delivering capital improvements. Through careful review of our internal procedures, we have shaved months off of the capital design process, increased timely public design commission approval from 20% to 80%, and reduced average construction time by two and a half months. These improvements are especially notable in light of the tremendous volume of projects being managed by the agency. In the administration's first term, we completed 374 capital projects worth $1.29 billion. In FY17, 87% of our projects completed construction on time, and 85% of our projects were completed with construction within budget. We currently have 577 capital projects, 76% from FY14, of which about a 163 are in design, 211 in procurement, and 203 in construction. Many of you may be familiar with the individual projects that have been plagued with complications and delays for years. Through, the, through most of these projects predate my arrival here at the agency, I am pleased to announce that we've made tremendous progress in clearing this backlog of troubled projects before my tenure. With 70 of these 98 projects now in construction, we will continue to work with you and your colleagues to resolve the projects that have been stalled. 
At the same time, I'm extremely proud of our efforts to bring transparency and accountability into the process that many considered confusing and unwieldy. We want to work with New York. We want New Yorkers to know about the progress these projects are making. So we made sure the public can access detailed and robust information about all of our ongoing capital projects. The Capital Project Tracker, launched under my tenure in 2014, is an online searchable tool updated daily that allows anyone to look up a specific park and learn more about the capital project's status. I'm proud to update the Council that to date the tracker has received 428,000 website visits giving you and other New Yorkers the information they need about park improvements in their community and in real time. We've made substantial progress with our internal improvements, but we recognize we have further to go. There are significant portions of the capital process that lie outside our agency's control, but we look forward to continuing our participation in the citywide conversation about the capital process and partnering with Council, especially the newly created Capital Subcommittee, to explore this topic. The guiding principles of this administration and our agency has been and will continue to be equity, which to us simply means fairness. For many years, the benefits of our park system, so vital for our city's health and happiness, were not enjoyed equally by all New Yorkers. Thanks to the leadership of Mayor de Blasio and through the strong partnership with the City Council and Borough Presidents, we've made tremendous progress over the past four years in fulfilling our commitment to a more inclusive park system. We've demonstrated this commitment to equity through a data-driven strategic framework that has shaped our community investment and major capital initiatives, known as the Framework for an Equitable Future. The cornerstone of this framework, the Community Parks Initiative, also known as CPI, has allocated more than $318 million in mayoral funding since its launch in the fall of 2014. CPI is dedicated to delivering capital improvements, enhancing programming, maintenance, and community partnership development in a way that is inclusive and equitable to 67 neighborhood parks and playgrounds that have been ignored for decades. The first CPI playground to be fully reconstructed and reopened was Van Alls Playground in Astoria, which complete, was completed ahead of schedule in June of 2017. After an investment of $3.5 million, it's now a major amenity for the community and kids at the neighboring school, PS 171. CPI continues to deliver these results, and just last week, on the first day of spring, as the chair mentioned, we held a ribbon-cutting relay, holding five ribbon-cutting ceremonies in five CPI playgrounds across the city, one in each borough, during an exciting all-day sprint across the city. We anticipate more ribbon cuttings to take place at CPI sites throughout the city in 2018 as these projects continue moving forward. Given the needs of a fast-growing city, a commitment to equity means we need to continue improving parks and playgrounds in all neighborhoods by providing a diverse set of recreational resources, especially those mid-sized, larger parks acting as anchors to the surrounding communities. In August 2016, Mayor de Blasio and NYC Parks announced the Anchor Parks Initiative, an investment of $150 million for major improvements at five large parks, one in each borough. Through Anchor Parks, we invest in new resources like soccer fields, comfort stations, running tracks, and walking paths, transforming these parks for the 750,000 New Yorkers who live in the neighborhoods that surround them and making these older parks feel new again. The first Anchor Parks projects, each slated to receive $30 million in major improvements, are on schedule and significant work is already underway. Our desire to innovate and find ways to maximize the impact and utility of our parks led us to focus on portions of our properties that were being underutilized, namely the entrances, edges, and adjacent park spaces that surround them. In 2015, we launched, launched the Parks Without Borders initiative reflecting a new approach to park design with the entire public realm in mind. This initiative included $50 million in mayoral funding, $10 million of which was applied toward projects already underway, and $40 million of which was dedicated towards eight showcase projects receiving large-scale capital redesigns. At this time, all eight showcase projects have their design 
finalized and approval by either the Public Design Commission or the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Three are undergoing procurement to identify construction contractor and the remaining five will enter procurement this spring. Pending a successful bidding process, we expect all eight sites will be in construction by early 2019 and completed in 2020. Equity means a lot to New Yorkers and they should have access to quality, green and open space. A major goal of NYC Parks and the Mayor's One NYC Plan is to have 85% of New Yorkers living within a walk to a park by 2030. We've made real progress toward that goal since 2014, increasing our park system walk to a park score to 81.5%. Our expanded school yards to playgrounds partnership with New York City Department of Education has opened more school yards to the public. We're adding new parkland from development of Chelsea Green, uh, a new park in Manhattan that will bring 3,000 more New Yorkers closer to a local park to the acquisition of City Storage site in Brooklyn, which will become part of the Bushwick Inlet Park. And the conversation uh, on the conversion of Brookfield Landfill, uh, of Brookfield Park in Staten Island, which put our city's portfolio of parkland over 30,000 mark for the first time. Further, our Green Thumb community team uh, added 40 new gardens to the network over the previous term, including the permanent preservation of 34 gardens transferred to us by our agency partners at HPD, allowing more New Yorkers to connect with their neighbors through community gardening. And our recreation centers saw a participation grow by 146% with over 700,000 new participants. We reduced our recreation center membership fee for military veterans and people with disabilities, and we slashed our tennis permit fees in half, allowing more New Yorkers to take advantage of recreational and wellness opportunities available to them. To deliver an equitable park system, all of our parks must be maintained in the highest quality. So I created a new commission level position, a chief operating officer, to standardize our maintenance efforts across the city and to improve our management practices to provide more enjoyable park experience to all New Yorkers. For example, we all know our parks and playgrounds are used seven days a week, but in previous years, they were at times only being cleaned five days a week, resulting in overflowing garbage bins and litter strewn throughout the park come Monday morning. In this administration, we have reconfigured staffing patterns to provide additional maintenance on the weekends. And the mayor has provided expanding baseline funding for increased seasonal maintenance staffing, ensuring that our parks and playgrounds stay clean and welcoming even throughout a busy weekend. We were pleased to share in the preliminary mayor's report that the percent of parks rated acceptable for overall condition and for cleanliness in fiscal year 18 was 85% an increase from the same period in fiscal year 17. Throughout this first term, we placed a major focus on the engagement with park users and community residents to, to really get them involved in the local parks. Through the work of our public programs division, we provided 2.5 million children and recreational opportunities through our Kids in Motion initiative, largely serving communities in need. Our urban park rangers provided a quarter of a million New Yorkers with an incredible educational experience in the great outdoors through programs such as the Natural Classroom. Over 100,000 New Yorkers enjoyed movie-going experience in the park through Movies Under the Stars, our partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. And over the past four years, Partnership for Parks, our joint program with the City Parks Foundation, supported over 1,300 community park groups and helped over 98,000 volunteers get involved and help their parks to meet their full potential. We all worked hard to, better, to include a broad public input in park design. Simply put, we're listening to the voices that need to be heard, the local community members and park users that rely on these parks, so they can tell us how these reimagined parks can best meet their needs. In the past, public meeting sessions for park projects were often held during the day, resulting in very few attendees, leaving most local residents feeling that they weren't included in the conversation about their parks. So we moved the sessions to the evening when most people could attend, especially children, and our Partnership for Parks Outreach Coordinators actively engage community organizations to help get the word out 
and encourage local park users to attend. For the first time in the agency's history, the showcase projects for our Parks Without Borders initiative were selected using direct public input chosen from thousands of park nominations received via our information session sessions and our agency website. This new approach to engagement isn't just reconnecting New Yorkers to the local parks, it's strengthening connections with our broader communities. NYC Parks is also committed to resiliency and sustainability. In this administration's first term, we planted over 620,000 trees, completing our Million Trees Initiative two years ahead of schedule, and planted over 5 million flowers. We engaged over 2,000 volunteers to complete our tree census count to catalog all New York City street trees and we have imported that data into an online resource, the NYC Street Tree Map, allowing the public to learn about the trees in their neighborhood, record and share stewardship activities, and see the ecological benefits of trees in the front of their home, in their neighborhood, and across the city. Our parks and open spaces, especially those located in vulnerable areas, need to have the ability to withstand and recover from disruptive weather events such as coastal storms and catastrophic floodings as well as more gradual threats such as sea level rise and tidal inundation associated with climate change. To that end, we've updated our design guidelines to incorporate best practices in our park's design. The recently reconstructed 5.5 mile Rockaway Boardwalk is a perfect example of how, par how a park asset can serve as both a recreational amenity attracting millions of visitors every summer, as well as a resiliency measure and our first line of defense in the event of an extreme weather event. Our sustainability and greening efforts also includes the restoration of 163 acres of wetlands and forests by our National Natural Resource Group and our Forestry Division. It is helping protect neighborhoods that are vulnerable to the urban heat island effect by planting additional street trees, and trees with funding made available through the Mayor's Cool Neighborhoods Initiative. Our citywide services staff are making important improvements to the park's operated buildings, adding green roofing, install more efficient boilers, and decreasing our use of fuel oil by 41%. All of these efforts allow us to plan the long-term res resiliency and sustainability of our open spaces and facilities. We are proud of the achievements over the past four years and we look forward to continuing this work. The Mayor's FY19 preliminary budget reflects our agency's ongoing priorities, providing for an operating expenses of $501.9 million. The preliminary budget includes several important additions to the agency's expense budget, including baseline funding uh, for pay increases for a seasonal uh, city seasonal aids, as well as 4,500 seasonal aid participants in our Parks Opportunity Program. It also provides for new hires to address maintenance and operational needs at parks and playgrounds, reopening to the public as part of the first phase of CPI to account for heavier usership of these reimagined and revitalized parks. Additionally, it includes fundings for new hires and staff, uh, staff overtime to increase late day cleaning and collection service in parks in the rat mitigation zones in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan as well as the purchase of big belly trash compactors and steel trash cans. The preliminary five-year capital budget included the current fiscal year provides a total parks capital budget of $4.1 billion with $92 million in mayoral funding for improved new capital projects. This preliminary budget is relatively cautious and conservative in light of the economic impacts faced by the city in relation to the decisions made at the state and federal level but it still gives our agency the resources we need to get the job done. With tremendous support from Mayor de Blasio and in partnership with the City Council, parks will continue to find innovative ways to improve maintenance and operations, programs and services to improve the experiences in parks and public spaces. We'll continue to focus on working smarter and more efficiently, streamline the capital process, and we'll continue to be the Department of Fun, Health, and Happiness, improving the quality of life for New Yorkers, all over this great city. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you today and for your dedication to providing great parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. We look forward to continuing to work with the mayor and the city council to create a bright, bright green future and a more equitable and innovative park system. We value your participation and thank you for your support of our agency and we are now happy to answer your questions that you may have.
I'm glad you're happy to answer our questions. Um, I just want to thank uh, all the people who are sitting behind you, uh, whether they're parks people or employees or uh, advocates for parks. It's good to see such a large crowd of interested New Yorkers here today. If you would like to testify, uh, you need to register with the Sergeant at Arms, so if you haven't done so already, uh, please do that. Uh, we have been joined since uh, the Commissioner began his testimony by Council Members Costa Costantanidis, who has Van Olst Playground in his district. He also has an anchor park, and I'm jealous. Uh, ben Kalos, uh, Councilman Jimmy Van Bramer, Councilman Francisco Moyer, and uh, Councilman Mark Jonai. Uh, Commissioner, since this is a hearing on the budget, why don't we start with that? And uh, I have to tell you, we are uh, a bit disappointed that uh, the preliminary budget has the budget of the Department of Parks and Recreation going down. And uh, if things hold the way they are, it would be at only 0.58 of 1% of the city budget. Still $501 million, which is a lot of money, but there are a lot more New Yorkers now. And my colleagues and I are very concerned about that, and I hope you can shed some light on that today. Well, as you know, uh, if you compare it to last year, it's about a little bit more before the budget process started. Uh, if you compare the one shots that were added to the budget, yes, it's now down to 501. Uh, as you know, uh, moving into the season, there is some concern and uncertainty what's happening at the federal and state level. And so when we work with both uh, the mayor's office and OMB, uh, we're providing uh, a budget uh, that we believe can address the needs in New York City. You also know this is the beginning of the budget process. And so as we have this hearing and ongoing conversations, I'm confident that both OMB and the mayor's office will hear your concerns to see how the budget process will unfold. But we're preparing a budget that we're very confident we can maintain the incredible assets here in New York City. Uh, we have a new chief operating officer, and we're changing our approach about how we maintain and care for our parks. Uh, so I understand your concern about the budget. It is starting higher where we started about a year ago. We started the, uh, the budget process. Uh, so we're just optimistic as the process continues, uh, we'll be able to address uh, some of the uh, council members' concerns. Well, I hope we'll, we'll see your optimism um, develop in, uh, and when we see the executive budget and we hold the next hearing in May um, on that, I hope that we will see increases. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, and as you mentioned today, we're up to nearly 8.6 million uh, New Yorkers. Uh, I think when I was about 10, there were 7 million New Yorkers in 1970, so that is an immense increase. And um, as, I've, as I've known for a long time, but has been reinforced to me since I became chair of this wonderful committee, uh, people depend upon their parks in so many different ways. Um, all right, we hope to get back to at least 0 0.62. 0 0.63 would be better. Um, communications from uh, your agency. In this current fiscal year, uh, the council has provided $16 million in expense funding to assist the department with their overall operating budget with regard to the parks equity initiative and park maintenance in addition to uh, individual council members designated allocations for programming on their parks property in their respective uh, districts. It is the council's responsibility to track these dollars, which I'm sure you appreciate, and to assure that the funding is being put to work for the correct purpose and with an appropriate time frame. Upon accepting these allocations from the council, the department accepts and agrees to hold itself accountable to the council staff and the members by providing updates to each project in a transparent and timely manner. It has come to my attention that this is not currently the case in all cases. So my first question with regard to this is what are the current internal policies and procedures with regard to responding to project update requests from the City Council? Well, uh, I I'm surprised to hear that that is not the case. Uh, all of the borough commissioners are instructed to keep all council members up to date. Uh, we have an open door policy. Any council member can call for an update, but we proactively reach out to all the council members to give them an update on capital projects as well as any other special programs. We also make it a special point to there be any significant delay in the capital process that we contact the council member first before we even put it on our capital tracker so that they have the courtesy of understanding if there's a significant delay. So this is our commitment, and I make that commitment to you now going forward. So our policy is we encourage all of our borough commissioners which have direct contact uh, with the council members to update as often as possible so that they know the status of their capital projects as well as other funding for other programs they may have. Yes, I, I appreciate the capital side, and you touched a little on the expense side, but I've heard 
even today because they know there's a hearing um, about the expense side because there are significant resources that we have uh, dedicated uh, the Parks Equity Initiative and uh, the M&O money. So I I'd appreciate uh, your illuminating us a little more on that. My commitment again, and I'll have a meeting after this meeting to reinforce to staff that it is our desire to update council members uh, as many times as they want to on not just the capital, but the other expense side programs. Okay. Would you commit to a certain time frame? Uh, you know, we get sometimes, and I appreciate this, I will ask questions that you just can't answer, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if you could commit today to a certain time frame that your staff could get back to uh, my colleagues or their staff members because it can get a little frustrating because we're, after all, we're all answering to our constituents. If there's a phone call and we could respond, we will. So I'm not sure I understand the question. I do know I encourage our borough commissioners and all of our staff uh, to give the highest priority to elected officials and communicate back if there's an update for information. I will speak to them to find out what concern there is. Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, but our goal from my point of view is that it is critically important we maintain a close working relationship with council, whether it's capital or programming or any other concern they may have. I appreciate that and I thank you for your response. Um, on the Parks Equity Initiative, uh, at the past uh, budget adoption, the council provided four and a half million dollars to support the City Parks Foundation and other local community groups uh, to do programming in smaller neighborhood parks. I would like at this time if you could provide a uh, status update on the initiative itself. In terms of the initiative, uh, there was 1.4 million allocated directly to NYC Parks. Uh, about of that, 1.1 was allocated to the City Parks Foundation, additional to Parks Foundation, and that 1.9 was allocated to other organizations with NYC Parks. Uh, and so in terms of the status, Most of the work will start to take place here in the spring, but that work right now is ongoing. Okay. And do um, you have any suggestions in how we might working over, we're hoping obviously to continue to fund these programs, how they might work better from your point of view or from any of your, your staffers' point of views? I'm certainly willing to have uh, the person who heads this up, Kate Smellman, follow up with any member or someone from your office in particular to take any ideas if there's any concerns that these are not moving uh, quick enough. We'll certainly willing to have a meeting afterwards to discuss any specific issues you may have about these, this fund. And have you, just for our edification, have you identified anything that's particularly glaring in terms of uh, parks performing on, on, under these monies? No, not in particular, but it's something I can get back to you on. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, parks maintenance, uh, the FY19 preliminary budget does not include $9.6 million in funding provided by the council in the fiscal 2018 adopted budget for city parks workers. Uh, the loss of this funding will affect at least 150 gardeners and I was happy to join you this morning, Commissioner, at the citywide conference on horticulture. I was very impressed with the, some of the people who are here today. Um, sitting behind you were there as well. We had um, about 300 people there. Um, and I am certainly committed to that, and I know you are, but the preliminary budget um, does not include funding for that, and the loss of that funding um, would greatly affect the department. Uh, is the council for any reason could not pick up this funding this year? Is there a plan by the administration to pick it up? Well, as you know, this is really the beginning of the process. Uh, those conversations will occur as we start moving toward the executive. Uh, so I do know this is an issue that has come up year after year. So I'm very confident and I'm certain that the conversation about those 150 positions will be a topic of, con topic of conversation as the budget process uh, continues. I appreciate that because it's a top priority for us here in the council uh, with regard to parks. Um, I will skip the last question that because I, I, I'm going to skip that one, okay. Um, something that affects my neighborhood and uh, many neighborhoods throughout the city of New York is stump removal. And I would say I'm stumped, but that would be, uh, be a little too much. So we get a tree cut down, it's dead. Um, I want to thank uh, particularly uh, Queens Parks. I, I, I didn't get to visit every neighborhood, but Queens, Eastern Queens, 
uh, all the way down, uh, Board 7, Board 11, and Board 13 were particularly hard hit um, for the first nor'easter that took down over a thousand trees, um, many of them in my district. And I want to publicly thank uh, Queens Park's you and Queens Park's Commissioner Lewandowski uh, for their speedy responses uh, to those uh, down trees. Um, question A, uh, what is the overall budget for tree pruning and stump removal? I know we have made progress in this area over the last few years. I'm going to refer that to First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. The current fiscal year budget for both uh, uh, tree pruning and stump removal is $8.7 million for pruning, $3 million uh, for stump removal, $2 million of which was uh, baseline uh, mayoral funding, and $1 million was added by the Council at adoption last year. Okay. The proposed budget for FY19 is, continues the $8.7 million for tree pruning uh, and the $2 million baseline for stump removal. Okay. And this is a question that's on a lot of people's minds, and I hear it, and I'm going to ask you today, since you're under oath, why can't we take out the stump at the same time we take out the tree? Because it can sit there, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, for, in some cases for years, and I know occasionally uh, parks will do a blitz where they'll remove many, many stumps in a particular neighborhood, but it really is frustrating uh, to homeowners and to apartment dwellers um, where we remove trees and then the stump just sits there and sits there and sits there. And in a forever wild forest, that's fine. We let Mother Nature take its course, but on Bell Boulevard and Springfield Boulevard, it's not so fine. So I'd love to know if there's some impediment to you doing it. Is it different contractors? Can we work on this so that we could get it? You know, it would really be ideal as we do take the, the dead tree down, take the stump out and plant a new tree all in one hour. I know you have the capability to do that, but it just doesn't seem to happen. Uh, we, we do have the skills to do that. Uh, we don't have the capacity to do it all of the time. And the tree removal operation is very different from the stump removal. It requires completely different equipment and, uh, and, and you know, different kinds of support than you need when you're removing a tree. And having it all at one place at the same time uh, can be very inefficient. How about in the same day, Commissioner? I, I understand. But it can be, very, it can be very inefficient. And, you know, frankly, we focus the work of our uh, tree workers, the climbers and pruners, who are excellent and highly skilled on the most uh, serious hazardous conditions, like the oh, almost 5,000 tree emergencies that occurred just during this month. Uh, and when you, you know, focus on that, it's hard to get back to doing uh, routine work like stump removal, which I understand completely is, is a nuisance and an eyesore, uh, but it doesn't, in most cases, uh, pose the same danger as a, as a tree uh, that is damaged or, or dead and needs to be removed. Uh, uh, so we, we have found that contracting out with private companies to do the work is much more cost effective and efficient, uh, thanks to the money that both the mayor and the council has provided over the last few years. We've made significant inroads into the backlog of stumps, but we generate more every day. And as you noted, we got a in lot the recent now, storms, we here. have a thousand more that we weren't planning on having. and suddenly we have to work them into our work streams as well. So uh, we are focusing on removing that backlog, getting rid of the older ones uh, first whenever we can, using our tree planting contracts as, as well as our stump removal contracts uh, to eliminate the stumps. Uh, but right now there will always be some lag between removing a dead tree and removing a stump. Are you, I just want to make sure I understand this totally. I think you were fairly clear, but so it's, it's parks employees that are removing the trees because we see them in their bright orange trucks and the place where they dump the trees and have to grind them is in my district in Cunningham Park. So I see a lot of them because they're going to and fro. The stump removal itself, private contractors? For the most part, or primarily yes, okay. we can remove stumps with our own staff. We do have some of the equipment, uh, but our, again, our staff is focused on the dead tree removal, on the hazardous tree conditions, uh, which take priority over stump removal. Okay. All right, I appreciate that. Um, last question: Would it help if we bought you some new equipment? It, it's not really a question of equipment. We do have some equipment for that work, but if we were to use that, we wouldn't be doing the the hazardous trees and the dead trees. Okay. That's the trade-off we have to make. All right. Uh, changing topics a little bit, crime in parks, and in regards to the uh, most recent uh, preliminary mayor's management report, 
there were 670 major felonies uh, reported on Parks, pro Parks properties and 547 crimes against properties in all parks excluding Central Park. This is a significant jump from the previous year and it looks like it could be even higher when the fiscal 2018 numbers come out if all things were to remain the same. Um, I am certain that you work with the NYPD on this issue, but can you talk about that a little, Commissioner? Well, I do want to put things in context. When you look at the city's footprint, parks represents 14%. Uh, crime in parks is less than 1%. Uh, and while there seems to be a slight increase, uh, we're having more people uh, using our parks. And so with that, we are seeing people enjoying all of our parks uh, across the board. Uh, we get an estimated 130 million visits, just visits, not visitors to our parks every year. Uh, we are working closely with NYPD. Uh, we watch the numbers carefully. Uh, we do know, for example, uh, if a cell phone is left down and someone takes it, that is considered a grand larceny. Uh, so we look very carefully into the crimes itself. Yes, it's called apple picking. It has it just happened in our parks, uh, unless if you have an iPhone. Uh, but this is something we take very seriously every single crime. So we do have our Urban Park Service working closely with NYPD as well as the borough commissioners to not just look at the large parks where it's taking place, but the location within those parks so we can do a better job, both NYPD as well as parks, uh, enforcement patrol, seeing what we can do to improve uh, what is happening within the park. It could be lighting, it could be an obstacle, so we're just doing further investigation. But it's something we take very seriously, and we are, in fact, working with N by NYPD to address it. Okay. Do you, any reason that the NYPD has been able to identify, I know that the population is going up in general, but, and I, I don't want to nitpick on statistics, but it does seem that the crime rate is going up a little faster. Crime rate in the city is going down, and it, it is troubling, and maybe it's just because there are more people in parks. We do believe there are more people in parks. Uh, we've seen an increase. We do our user counts, and we are noticing more people are using our parks. Uh, again, we're going to work with NYPD to pinpoint the location. Right now, we get data per park, not per location within the park. So that's the other level, but that requires one-on-one -on -one meetings. Our borough commissioners, as well as our assistant commissioner for our urban park service, is uh, working directly with the precinct where those parks are located to pinpoint where they're occurring so we can do better proper intervention. Should it be design or patrols, that's now the next level we're moving into. And um, do you have a breakdown on the number of PEP officers assigned to each of the major parks uh, that saw increases in crimes against persons? We do. I can either share that with you now or I can submit it to you after the hearing. But we do have the numbers of both our, our stationary uh, posts as well as our mobile. But we can either share that with you now, yeah, if, but if we do have If you could send it. it to Mr. Grace and uh, he'll share it with me, I would greatly appreciate that. And um, before I turn this over to my colleague, Ms. Gibson, I want to talk a little bit about um, the number of summonses that have been issued in parks. Uh, in the first four months of fiscal year 18, uh, the parks de the department issued 10,209 summonses which is an alarming increase compared to 6,722 issued during the same period in fiscal year 2017. If the current pace is kept up, uh, we will come close to 30,000 summonses, which would be more than 10,000 uh, more than we issued in the previous two fiscal years. Both years were about 20,000. Uh, for the benefit of the committee and those listening, could you tell us why there have been, or why you believe there have been so many more summonses written in the past uh, we're so. responding to community and city council concerns about quality of life in parks. Uh, these violations are given to canine related incidences, uh, illegal vending, illegal parking. Uh, so it's addressing the quality of life issues in the park. Our Parks and Force Patrol first educate the public, and then if there's noncompliance, they will issue a violation. So these summonses, uh, the amount doesn't mean that better bad things are happening in parks. It's just that uh, we are addressing community concerns about some of the issues we're hearing. Uh, in terms of the canine-related incidents, I don't have to be specific, but that's when, let's just say, dog walkers leave gifts uh, in the park, and we want to make sure there's a nice experience for park users and families and children. So we are seeing an increase in those summonses. Again, illegal vending, a common complaint from both council members and community and also uh, bike riding in the wrong locations, Ill illegal parked cars. So these are, or just parking car auto-related violations. So these are the type of issues you're seeing. And again, our goal is to improve 
the quality of life in our parks, so you're just seeing more enforcement on those levels to ensure all New Yorkers have a good park experience. I thank you for that answer. Um, I just request that if you could, uh, if you could give us a breakdown of the numbers by borough sure. and by community board and by major parks, that would be greatly appreciated. You could send that information to uh, Mr. Grace as well. At this time, are you ready, young lady? Okay, I'm older than you, so I can call you. Uh, yes, I will acknowledge uh, our colleagues that have joined us. Uh, Mr. Keith Powers from the Borough of Manhattan. Also from the Borough of Manhattan, Mr. Mark Levine, the former chair of this committee. And from uh, Staten Island, also uh, Mr. Joseph Borelli. So thank you all for being here today. And now I'm happy to turn this over to my uh, uh, chair, uh, Gibson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. And good afternoon again, Commissioner. I'm going to go through just a series of questions and then I'll turn it back over to uh, my colleague. But first, I wanted to just, again, thank you for all the work you've done. Um, I have a question about the federal budget. <laughs> Always a topic we love to discuss. Um, the fiscal 2019 preliminary plan includes a little over $3 million in federal uh, CDBG funding. And I'm sure that you're aware there's a potential loss of that funding. So I wanted to ask, um, there are larger agencies that do receive a significant amount of federal funding, but certainly Parks in the past has received about $11 million. So I wanted to understand what those funds are used for. Um, and certainly in light of the climate in which we're working, if there's a potential of losing that funding for CDBG, um, are you able to absorb that particular cut? Well, first, uh, we're having these conversations with OMB. Uh, one shot, it was 11 million. Uh, three was uh, specifically for, um, there were one shots of about 8 million and then 3 million, that's year to year. Uh, okay. We expect 5 million to carry over. Okay. Uh, but of course, we're very concerned about this, not just for the parks budget, but the administration's concern of this for the entire budget. So we're gonna have ongoing conversations as the reality of the federal budget uh, comes to pass. Uh, but our goal, of course, is to not see a decrease in the level of service to keep maintaining those areas that rely on some federal funding. So I appreciate the question. It's still ongoing conversations we're having with the administration, but we have identified what is going to carry over. We believe that's about five million. Uh, Three million is what directs us effectively in terms of Green Thumb programs okay. and some other projects we have. But uh, we appreciate it, but I don't have an answer now as we work okay. through these issues. And is that, uh, that's all expense money for, in, in addition to Green yes. Thumb, other is programs? It's all expense money, correct. Okay, okay. Uh, certainly want to uh, commit joining my colleague and working with you. I mean, we've been working on so many fronts uh, fighting against an administration um, that has not been favorable to the city of New York. So I guess this is just one more um, battle that we have to uh, entertain. <laughs> yes, I mean, fortunately, although every dollar counts, uh, for parks, it's small compared to some other agencies, but this is something that we are starting to talk and plan for a contingency of what do we do sh sh should this be a reality. Okay, great. Um, your 10-year capital budget uh, that's delineated by category, um, we recognize that there are other agencies that manage about 26% of parks capital projects. Uh, that's about $1.2 billion. So I wanted to understand the School Construction Authority and Department of Design and Construction. Um, are those the two agency authorities um, that manage some of parks projects? Are there other agencies? And what is the relationship that you have with at both SCA and DDC as it relates to capital? Uh, yes, they do, but the amounts are quite small. So School okay. Construction Authority will build some and then DDC the other. Uh, but it is quite, in terms of uh, DDC, uh, this is in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, 270 million. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, EDC, 170 million, and I don't believe, and DOT, close to 700 million. Uh, we have nothing from SCA. Okay, so just DDC, EDC, and DOT. Correct. Okay, and generally, at what stage does the Parks Department recognize that another agency has to come in? So DDC, as an example, I've been working very closely with them in my new capacity, and they have a number of agency clients that they work with, and depending on the agency, DDC comes in during the design, um, during other phases of a project, so what is the relationship that Parks has with DDC, when do they come in, and how is that relationship to date? We do it at the very beginning. Uh, so that's something where we bring them in. 
uh, and it, it varies sometimes about who designs the project, but at the very beginning we have a conversation depending on the nature of the project itself. If it's more engineer driven, uh, if it's a bridge reconstruction per se, okay. then DDC will play the role at designing that project. But it does, in some cases, we'll design it, procure it, and then hand it to, to DDC. So it does vary, but we start those conversations at the pre-design phase so we know exactly for that specific project, how is it going to uh, unfold. Okay. And speaking of pre-design, um, I wanted to ask as an example about the, the wonderful comfort stations that we love so much. Um, and I'm gonna tie that into project costs and timeline um, because recognizing that DDC oversees a lot of projects, we've been working with them on the front end planning unit, which I know has been very helpful to the Parks Department in terms of more design staff for your um, agency, which I'm sure has been very helpful, about $5 million. But just in general, um, at what point does the Parks Department recognize that cost controls dictate the overall specific project? So many of us attribute Comfort stations, we used to believe they were about two million, and now I know that there are times when it can get to 3.8 million or 4 million. So is there some sort of a standard design or a standard practice that Parks has or is looking to adopt to try to, you know, bring some more um, standardization to this process so that we can have a better idea moving forward? Yes, so okay. when I came on board, uh, the message to staff, there was some that were already in design and went through PDC approval. Anything new, we ca now came up for new comfort station, a standardized design that is across our entire parks. So that is something we now put in place so we can now compare project to project. So that's something that has already been implemented and you start to seeing some of those new comfort stations come online. Uh, just to give you a sense about what's happening with some of the new comfort stations, this is new. Uh, from 2011 to 2016, the price of our comfort stations have increased by 175%. Now that's coming from the market. Uh, we have a choice of not accepting that bid and putting it out to bid again. That delay will take us five to six months or we accept the, uh, the actual price from the contractor and proceed. So we are looking at innovative ways to using in-house crews to do some reconstructions, not new construction. Even, the, even those that we just do a renovation and reconstruct an existing comfort station, that between 2009 and 2016 went up by 33%. So right now for a reconstructed comfort station 20 by 20 is about 8.5 million. For a brand new comfort station, as you s stated, uh, bids are coming in about 3.5. So this is something uh, that we are concerned about. Uh, we've standardized our design to bring costs down okay. and we're continually looking for other options to see how we can control the cost of new comfort stations. Okay, wow, that, those numbers are painful to hear. Um, and I think many of us, after we're termed out, we have found a new career. We're going to build comfort stations. More contractors are <laughs> better. We want to be competitive so we can bring prices down. That brings me to my next question, and I usually ask this of, of many agencies. Uh, we are very ambitious on MWBE requirements and goals, yes. minority and women-owned businesses, yes. and really for the Parks Department in your portfolio, opening the arena for more bidders, for more diversity. Um, I'm grateful that your staff gave me the longest and most detailed summary of every process you have to go through. So I do have, while I, I don't agree the comfort station should cost nowhere near $4 million, but I understand, right? Um, and I think, you know, m many of my colleagues and I, after we get that briefing, understand a lot more. That doesn't mean we accept the practice. It means that we're even more committed to change it. Um, and so what are we doing as a department to try to open up the arena for more bidders and really looking at diversity across the board so we're not working with a small few uh, of bidders? Well, first, it is in our best interest to increase as many qualified contractors as possible. We don't want to limit the pool. If you're qualified and you can do the work, we want you to bid on a project. For MBE, MWBE in particular, you should know that uh, we are ranked, our agency, second in the city and in, in terms of awards, in the first two quarters of FY18, we awarded 49.6 million in contracts, and 31% of that went to MWBE firms. 
and we rank second in the city. We have a whole team committed to whether it's outreach sessions, uh, to uh, various contractors, including MWBE. We want as many qualified contractors as possible uh, to bid on our projects. So that is within our interest to make sure we do that outreach. Wow, so that means you're aiming to be number one? Uh, we always aim okay. to be number always one. Aim, okay, I'm getting I tired of being number two. We are shooting for number one. Okay, good, good. I wanted to ask about the number of construction projects that have been complete. Um, in fiscal 2017, the Parks Department completed 104 uh, construction projects, and that was more than the goal of 100 in fiscal 2018. Um, currently, there are 2,200 projects in the capital commitment plan which has increased incredibly. So I wanted to ask, uh, since the department surpassed your goal of 85 projects last year and 100 this year, has there been any discussion about raising that goal to a higher number? Is that well, a discussion well, now? First, a clarification on the 2200. Okay. Those are budget lines. They 2200 budget lines. <laughs> right, so it comes out to 577 projects. So uh, those budget lines Got come it. from different funding, so mayor, council, borough president, et cetera. But if you combine that together, there are 577 okay. projects. In terms of the, rate, the, the, the target, uh, we forecast year by year. It uh, looks at how many projects were received in total, and then we establish a target. So we'll, it changes from year to year, uh, but certainly our expectation is to set a reasonable target so that we can get as many projects completed as possible. So I just want to clarify the 2200, it was. Okay, so you mentioned in your testimony that you were um, working to lower the backlog of projects. So do you still have a backlog? And if so, what does that look like today? Well, let me say that there are two backlogs. The one I was referring to uh, was, well, I actually talked about both. The one we're referring to is that most of the council members were upset about projects delayed. The mm -hmm. vast majority of projects that were stalled before I started in 2014. Okay. That list was well into the hundreds, mm -hmm. under 200, but over 100, 150. We got those stalled projects that preceded my tenure now down to 98. Of those 98, 70 are in construction, which means in the next year, a year and a half, this plague mm -hmm. of delayed projects will be behind us, and that will focus on the current projects post 2014 when I arrived to minimize those delays. On any given year, depending on how many new projects will receive, between 10 and 20 projects for that fiscal year is in our backlog that have to move to the following year. So our commitment is to get that number down each year. It all depends on how many new projects we receive. If we get 100, in some years we get 140 projects for that year, so we have to make sure we move forward on all those projects, but when it's that high, usually there is a backlog of between 10 and 20. Okay, so in addition to addressing the backlog of projects, which I appreciate all of the effort to reduce that, um, certainly a lot of that before your tenure, coupled with the current projects and then potentially new projects. I mean, each of us, we meet with our park staff almost monthly to talk about new, you know, wish lists. You, you mean you, you wish that everything could be funded on the list? <laughs> and, you know, so what I'm asking is in terms of capacity, the staffing, the design team, the capital team, all of the processes that you have to go through, um, as well as some state oversight as well with state agencies that I, I learned about, um, historical landmarks and preservation. Um, are you at a point where you feel comfortable with the existing staffing you have to deal with capital projects? And if not, what does that request potentially look like? We are comfortable. We do have some vacancies that we need to fill, but we are comfortable. Uh, so you know, uh, compared to the stalled pre-14 projects, as I stated in my testimony, we've now cut design and construction through the entire process down for about five months. So that's showing the change of the pre-14 versus uh, post-14. Uh, we do have some vacancies, about 38 in capital. Uh, as we bring those on board, these are, of course, very specialized skills of either being licensed, uh, either in engineering or architecture. So our goal is once we get these folks on board, we'll continue to go on the good path in terms of uh, moving more quicker in the capital process. Okay. Um, I'm going to divert the rest of my time. Um, my chair, because I'm on his committee too, um, has to convene a hearing across the street, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos. 
thank you to uh, Parks Committee uh, Chair Gradunchik and uh, Vanessa Gibson, Capital Committee Chair, and thank you for my colleagues who deferred so I can ask a question and then run over. So I just need to touch base on three big items. First is just capital in my district. Other is concern around repairs that turn out to be Band-Aids versus long-term repairs that we need. And then the last is privatizing parkland. In 2014, Mayor de Blasio provided $35 million in capital bill to begin rebuilding the crumbling East River Esplanade. In 2017, the Esplanade in front of Gracie Mansion actually fell into the river. Now I'm grateful that work began this summer. I'd like to know why it took three years to get shovels in the ground and why I had to learn from our town, the local paper and the district that the project's actually been pushed back from a completion date of this spring to uh, this winter. So that is question one. We don't believe it's delayed. Uh, we're trying to understand the question. We don't believe there was a delay, so it's something we can address after the meeting because that, I'm that is that this. is great news. And then just why did it take three years to get shovels in the ground until after the Esplanade had already collapsed? Uh, I'm told by Deputy right. Commissioner we didn't have money in the budget. It was budgeted in 2014. You want to respond? Um, we did um, the area right around Gracie Mansion. What we what we did do is we decided instead of procuring a brand new contract to do that, we used an existing retaining wall contract to start that project. So the retaining wall contract. I'm sorry if I'm getting into too much detail. We had to start off with a change order because the items were not in that contract right away to start that project. But we're happy to say that we've been able to figure that out and work that out, and we're actually now in construction. Okay, and along the same lines. Sorry, Therese Braddock. Sure, and then along those lines, so my understanding is that Parks has budgeted 15.4 million on repairs that will, according to Parks, only last five to 10 years before additional work is required versus $56.9 million, which would prevent work for another 25 to 30 years. Uh, so for instance, at the location where there was a collapse, there's budgeted 7.9 million, which is a five to 10 year Band-Aid versus 18.9, which would keep it in good repair for 25 years. Will the city allocate the remaining $41.5 million to do this properly? Well, as you know, the mayor was very clear on having a greenway around the entire island of Manhattan. Uh, there is 56 million to do critical repairs on the esplanade, uh, basically between 60th and 125th. So that is one commitment. Number two, you're already aware the mayor had uh, dedicated $100 million to rebuild a new portion of Esplanade between 53rd and 61st Street. And then there's ongoing commitment through the East Harlem rezoning to do another portion. So there is a commitment to move forward. Uh, we're proceeding with that step by step, but all tolling that up, there's really hundreds of millions of dollars going into the Esplanade over time to improve it. I understand your concern, but clearly there is a commitment uh, by this administration to address the deficiencies on the East River Esplanade. My, my understanding is that there's still a shortfall of $169 million to cover from 60th to 125th if work is to continue into phase three. Uh, will that be allocated? Well, right now we want to, EDC is doing another waterfront inspection. Uh, as we look at any future estimates, we want to understand exactly what is needed. But as I stated, the mayor is committed to the East River Esplanade by clearly stating that he wants to see a continuous Esplanade and Greenway around the island of Manhattan. And to show this 56 million to 100 million and additional resources to East Harlem is a strong commitment that the mayor is serious about making sure that the, a resource on the east side will be implemented as well as on the well, west we, side. We are, we are looking for that extra $169 million to show that, uh, okay. put his money where his mouth is. Duly noted, Harlem. Council Member. And then I think last but not least, in your testimony, you stated, quote, for many years, the benefits of our park system, so vital for our city's health and happiness, were not enjoyed equally by all New Yorkers. I couldn't agree more. There's a playground in my district who was open in 1909. Since the 1970s, this park has been closed to the public for free during the year. The current cost per hour is a whopping $180 on Saturdays and Sundays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, the chair of the Parks Committee, his father used to play tennis in our public parks, and I've learned that his father did not have to pay $180 and perhaps may have been prohibited from doing so. This is actually the most expensive tennis bubble concession in the city of New York, with almost every other one at almost half the cost or less. 
So I guess the first thing is, do you believe that a parks facility charging $180 has an impact on the economic status or race of its users? Uh, and after the parks department offered multiple design options to the community that were approved by the community boards and local electeds, why parks reissued uh, the uh, same contract at $180 an hour last summer and why it's reissued the same RFP? Uh, well, let me answer the first one. We, we didn't reissue the same RFP, and as you know, throughout the entire process, I've been very straightforward, clear, and transparent about the entire process. First and foremost, it is a uh, Department of Transportation property. It is not a park and has not been a park. It has been concessioned. Uh, DOT has allowed the Parks Department to use it for a concession, and so that has been what it has been used for, I'm told, as long as anyone could remember. Uh, we did go through a process. We were very clear and transparent with the community about the options that were ahead of us. We had a pilot program this summer to see how that would unfold based on public input, uh, which helped frame uh, elements of the RFP. Uh, the RFP was issued, and we contacted the electors and the community board before that RFP was released. We're now in a process of evaluating that RFP that's looking for a minimum of three months of free uh, programming uh, in that facility. So that's about all I can say. I do know that uh, staff had talked to you and your staff about this further, uh, but this is something that we felt we've been fully transparent uh, throughout the process, uh, and now uh, we are optimistic there will be a continued public use on Department of Transportation property. Every other bubble in the city is Columbus Day to April. At this location, you put out an RFP from September to June. It feels wrong to me to charge a New Yorker $180 to use a park that's been a park since 1909, according to the Board of Aldermen. Does it feel wrong to you to charge $180 to use a park? We evaluate, there's a, always a combination of capital invested as well as uh, what uh, the concessionaire needs to do. We always look for capital improvement, and they have to go out and get a loan uh, to upkeep and improve a space. Uh, we look at both the capital cost as well as the fees to make it successful. Uh, Parks is not in the money-making business. This goes into the general fund. Our goal is to offer an experience on a city property. In this case, it is the Department of Transportation. It is not parks, uh, which means that that park can close at any time should DOT need to do repairs on the Queensboro Bridge. I hear your concern, but this is something that I felt we have been entirely transparent, the RFP process as well as the decision-making process. But as you know, I'm certainly willing to sit down with you further and have conversations. Mr. Thank Kielos, you to the yes, chairs for their indulgence. This along. Thank you very much. Good luck with your hearing. We'll go back now to Chair Gibson. Thank you. Thank you again. And I just wanted to just touch on the commitment plan. Um, it's also another topic I've been uh, learning more and more about. And typically the commitment plan uh, front loads a lot of planned commitments for capital projects in the first year as well as year two of the plan. Um, and not all of the agencies really meet these targets. Um, the Department of Parks, their commit your commitment plan shows 60% of all of your commitments were completed in fiscal 2017, which is, and I give you credit, an improvement from the prior year's history of commitments. Um, so given the performance history and what we typically see within city agencies, um, it it appears that the Parks Department will end the year with unmet commitment targets as well as the significant uh, appropriations that are available that could be rolled over into fiscal 2019 as well as the outer years. So you indicated in your testimony that in the administration's first term, there were 374 capital projects completed worth over $1.29 So I wanted to ask, uh, does the Parks Department have a plan to raise that commitment level to meet the actual commitment plan that you have put forth? Well, we're meeting with OMB. Uh, it varies from year to year. Uh, okay. It's something we're now exploring, whether we can take a harder look at that commitment rate and what we need to roll over year to year. But it changes year to year. Uh, we'll be working with OMB to see what that will be going forward. You are correct this year. It is a 60 uh, percent. Uh, we want to make sure that we stabilize that over time so there's greater expectation for the council, for the public, and for the administration. So those conversations right now are ongoing uh, with OMB. 
Okay, and it would be helpful if you could just share with us uh, some of those conversations to the extent that the council can be helpful. Um, you know, we approve the budget with the budget appropriations every year, and our speaker has been very passionate about agencies' contingency plans at a certain rate. Um, many agencies finish the year with excess appropriations, and their commitment rate um, doesn't always match the commitment plan. So, and, and just to clarify, that commitment includes also acquisition and each. Right. Right. project of course. is different, so that's why we really need to sit down with OMB to get that realistic commitment number so that is clear and transparent to everyone. Okay. Um, you talked about the community parks uh, initiative, which I'm a fan of. My district has certainly benefited from that. The total number of parks, uh, 67 through 2020. Um, can you give us an update on the progress of the initiative and where are we? Are we in phase two or are we still in phase one? Well, there was phase one, and then we had three parts of phase two. We started off with Like 30. 2A, 2B, and 2C? Yes, you could say that. <laughs> we started off with 35, and, and we found out it somewhat uh, was a lot to do in one school okay. board contractors, and so we did them in three tranches. In terms of phase one of 35, I'm proud to say we finished 14. We have really 15 finished, but we're growing grass on one. We want to make sure that it's ready for public use. So we've completed 15. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest, uh, the 20, will be finished uh, really by the end of 2018. So all 35 will be done by this year. Uh, okay. In terms of the next round, uh, we have about another 13 that are in active design. Uh, and then uh, the rest uh, are in procurement. So we're on schedule on our CPI projects. OK. So there will not be a phase three. We're staying in phase two, right? Part A, Part B, and Part C. Well, if I give you the numbers, <laughs> I'll give you the numbers for phase. Hang on another sheet. Who's you said 13 are in design, and the others are in procurement? Was, yeah, so it was 35 in phase one, 32 in phase two, okay. but it was broken down. I had it on the other sheet. Sorry. There it is. So it's, so 2A is 12, 2B is 9, and 2C is 11. Okay, got it. This is like Parks Department talk. Okay, oh, it's, 12, 9, and 11. I would prefer phase one, two, and three, but that's okay. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, the mayor and also the city council, and I'm pretty sure when we put together our official budget response to the mayor's preliminary plan, uh, we will continue to call for citywide savings. And I know a, every agency has been given that task by the mayor. Um, has the department started to talk about where you can find areas of, of savings? Yes, we have. Just give me one okay. second. So we identified about seven million. It was mostly uh, revenue driven. Okay. Is there others that, that's so far? Primarily that's been it. Okay, okay, got it. Um, and then I guess my, my final two questions that I wanted to ask, uh, and this is a very important Bronx project to me. Um, it abuts my community, is Cretona Park, one of the largest parks we have in the Bronx that serves South Bronx, West Bronx, Central Bronx. Um, major renovations over the next few years that are happening at Cretona Park. Um, we're reconstructing the nature center, the pool perimeter, fencing, pool towers, additional lighting. I talked to the NYPD. We've installed cameras. Is there an update that you could provide us on where we are with the renovations? Uh, in terms of Cretona Ball Field, uh, okay. it's scheduled to be completed in February of 2019. Uh, this ball field number five. Uh, the procurement is scheduled to be completed in 2018, which means that too will be done, the ball field in 2019. The Katrona Park Nature Center uh, is currently in construction, and that should be completed in September 2019. Uh, the pool, park perimeter, and fence uh, is scheduled to complete procurement by July 2018, which means it takes about a year for construction, mm -hmm. also July 2019. Uh, the Katrona Bathhouse Mezzanine, uh, and that's also supposed to be completed by 20, looks like 2019 is going to be a magical year for you, council member. And then right. the Katona Park Ooh, Comfort whoa. Station, uh, that one, we're having some challenges. Uh, we had rebid that three times unsuccessfully. 
Each time it's oh. unsuccessful is about a four to five month delay. So that one we'll keep working on to do how we can address uh, the engineer's estimate. So all are proceeding. 2019 seems to be the year all will be done, uh, but for the Cortona Park Conference Station. Okay. Um, I remember a conversation uh, late last year that my colleagues in the southeast in Soundview had with the Parks Department about some sort of emergency lighting, um, similar to what college campuses have in terms of any park always being able to access emergency 911 services. But generally speaking, um, I wanted to ask about lighting. Um, DOT is going through a massive uh, replacement of all of its street poles in the city, which I think is great. Um, Lighting in parks, um, is there a plan, and I don't want to, again, not park to park to park and project to project, but universal portfolio, um, are we looking at enhancing our lighting in parks to a higher level, a level of, of lighting where we can say that our parks are much more well lit? So the project you're referring to was a pilot. Uh, that okay, was initiated. yes, in Soundview, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, but in terms of lighting, we look at lighting uh, when we do a major reconstruction of a park. We look at lighting at that point. Uh, we also have to include that into the budget estimate. If not, they can be very expensive. So when we give an estimate, not, we don't always anticipate redoing all the lighting, but this is something we look like when we do a park renovation and lighting is needed. So. Uh, that is the answer for that one. Uh, I don't think it was anticipated for Cretona if there are existing light poles. We have to work with DOT and meet their lighting standards, but it's something we can certainly uh, take a look at closer going forward. Okay, and, and I understand that you have an opportunity through reconstruction and brand new construction to really put in the design that for meets- new lights. Right, for new lights. Right. Existing lights, DOT is now converting all lights in parks to LED, but to add new light poles in parks, that's mm -hmm. something that we look at when we have a major capital project in a park. Okay, so DOT is going to replace the existing light poles inside parks to be reflective of the ones that are on the street? Not the poles, the bulbs. The bulbs, Correct. okay, okay. So is that, that's ongoing, what's the time frame and how you, do you work with DOT to make sure that that happens? I don't know if we could find out the time frame. Okay. I've seen them already being done in a variety of parks. Okay. Uh, but we can find out the time frame and communicate that back to you. Okay, great. And you know, again, and the reason I ask is because the larger parks, so Cortona, Claremont, um, Orchard Beach, I mean, Pelham Bay Park, those parks will always be taken care of. Um, I guess I worry about the smaller playgrounds, like in my area, a Mullally Park, that isn't as you know heavily used, but it is, because it's available for all of the local residents and during the summertime. I just wanna make sure that the work certainly that I'm doing with Fernando Cabrera on Jerome, this is all a part of the same conversation. So I can't take care of certain parks and not look at all the others um, to make sure that they get equal attention as well, but I'm glad Glad to hear that. I wasn't aware that DOT was actually doing the installation. I thought it was the Parks Department, but um, I'm grateful for that, so thank you. Yes, DOT uh, oversees all of the lights in, in our parks and throughout the city, so that's why we have a relationship with them. We'll find out their plan for how they're rolling out, converting to LED in parks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Gibson. Um, we're gonna get to the members in a second. Um, but before we do, I have one question for the commissioner. Uh, in fiscal 19, commissioner, DPR's expense budget for capital division is just over $50 million. And most of this budget is funded through the capital interfunding agreement. Could you tell me and the members of this committee what percentage of a typical parks capital project, overall budget, goes to the department for design and scoping and procurement costs? 10%. 10%? Because I have heard anecdotal evidence it's much higher, so I'm believing you. But, 10%. But that number seems, is low compared to what I've heard. So, and is there a difference um, between, I assume that the percentage rate of IFA costs would be higher percentage-wise for a smaller project as opposed to a larger project or? 10%. 10%, you're gonna stick with that number, huh? 10%. All right, all right. Um, first up, my colleague from Flushing, Mr. Ku. We have five minutes on the clock. If you go to six minutes, I won't, uh, I won't yell. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just follow up uh, uh, with a uh, um, question. Council Member Gibson asked you, is it really true that it takes $4 million to make a new bathroom in the parks? 3.5 is the number for new construction, 1.8 for a renovated comfort station. 1.8 to renovate a comfort station. I, I, I'm very sad to hear that because that means our money is not worth anything now. It costs $1.8 million just to renovate a bathroom and four, almost $4 million to build a new bathroom. Our money used to be the benchmark of like, currency in the whole world. Now people will laugh us. Uh, council member, I share your concern. Uh, the parks does not set the price. It comes from the industry. Uh, we have a competitive bidding process, and we put it out there, and it concerns us as well. Uh, we are very concerned about escalating prices. We're doing whatever we can to keep prices down, but uh, that is the state of affairs right now uh, that, as I shared with you, uh, for new comfort stations, uh, in the last seven years, we've seen an increase in price of 175 percent. Uh, my only option is to reject the bid, uh, delay the project for six months, uh, but my concern is by waiting, prices will only go higher. So we are discussing what we can do uh, to figure out other alternatives that bring costs down, but we put out to bid, and the contractors are telling us that it will cost for a new comfort station 3.5, and that's an average. It can go higher, it can go lower. All right, uh, I'm not going to argue with that with you, but uh, no, we should like, ask more, like open up the bidding process so more like, small contractors can, we are. Yeah, We're doing can that. do the job. I think it should be much cheaper than that, that price. So, uh, and to also follow up with Council Member um, question, the crime is up in the parts. So uh, what happens if somebody gets mud in the park? Uh, do we have uh, like, uh, uh, cellular phone service in all the parks? No. I mean, can they call some With police cell right service? away? If uh, somebody I believe we do. I, I don't know if there are spots where you cannot get great cell service. Yeah. I imagine you know there probably are spots. I don't know of any. Uh, but typically, people do have cell service. There are cell towers throughout the city, a very dense uh, metropolitan environment. I don't know of any places where someone does not have cell service, but I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, so in, 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 in line of that, uh, can, have you ever considered uh, providing Wi-Fi service in the parks? In some of our parks, we do have Wi-Fi service. It's not in all parks and all locations, but we have. Uh, to do the Wi-Fi, you have to affix it to a certain location, uh, but we do work with some vendors to provide Wi-Fi service. And so we have that in some, not all of our parks. So have you ever considered like, like asking the Link NYC, because they are the Wi-Fi station, to put some of those uh, Link NYC in the parks? Well, we have yeah, to work. It's something areas. we can explore. I don't know if it's as simple as Link NYC, but we have certain providers, um, AT&T, Spectrum, offer some Wi-Fi in our parks. Uh, we want to exp expand our Wi-Fi service. We just have to find the best method to do that. Uh, but it's something that we're certainly open to providing more Wi-Fi uh, in our parks. I think you should make that as one of your goals, you know, to make Wi-Fi available to all New York uh, City parks uh, areas. Uh, uh, my, my, my next question is, uh, when you go to a playground or, or a park, right, usually there's a sign outside, say, uh, say uh, Maple Playground, right, or wherever. Uh, I'm, I want to make a suggestion that you, on this sign, you put a person's name there in charge of the playground. No, in case of uh, you want to call uh, something wrong about this playground or park, uh, call this person. Put a phone number or email and email there so they can call this person uh, in charge of this park. Because a lot of times, I walk to the parks and did the parks are dirty and, and my constituent complained to me, you know, who do I call? I said, call 311, you know? But I, I think but that's the right answer. to put yeah. the pressure on you guys, you should have a name. Well, well Whoever in charge the park department, right. in the particular playground or park, put his name or her name there 
So make her responsible, not 311. No. No. Well, first, uh, it, 311 is the right answer. Mm. Uh, secondly, in terms of our cleanliness, uh, we exceed the mayor's targets for cleanliness. If that park is not clean at the moment, uh, staff comes by several times a week. All of our parks are clean, and so it's just a matter of time before somebody comes by. But 311 is the right uh, number to call. Uh, we rotate staff all the time. To put a number probably would not be the most efficient way. By having 311, it gets us very quickly, and, and staff can respond. So that is the appropriate number to call is 311. Yeah, but, but if you have a name there, it's much better to be there than the oh, actually it may delay things, 311 would be much better because that way it's routed to the agency and we have an entire borough of operations that can respond. So 311 for us is the best mechanism to communicate a complaint. Uh, I, I disagree with you, but it's okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. We can't have agreement on everything. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Councilman Koo. Uh, next up, uh, Andrew Cohn is not here. If he comes back, we will... Uh, uh, Costa Costanta Nidis from the great borough of Queens. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll to saying my name uh, kind of messed it all up. I lost almost my whole time. <laughs> all right. Uh, so just kind of looking at. Uh, great to see you again, Commissioner. By the way, and all the team. Uh, so looking at the uh, resiliency and, and sustainability sector, mm -hmm. uh, when we decide to renovate a park, uh, either through CPI or for funding from the council members, what triggers a review for resiliency and sustainability measures in that park? In our guide, we have design guidelines that there's funding in place to actually do a waterfront project. You've now increased the level of complexity. It could involve DEP, DEC, other agencies. So uh, if it is within the scope of the project and is funding, we can look at it. Uh, so that's the approach that we take. If you take, for example, the, uh, the anchor parks for Astoria, uh, that was limited to the footprint of the park and not the shoreline per se. Right. So that is something where there'd have to be a future phase of dedicated dollars to fix that element. Uh, so it has to be scoped up front so we can get an estimate to figure out how much it will cost to restore uh, that project. But what about things like permeable pavement or that's, you know, that's thing, things, th those types of resiliency, sustainability uh, pieces that maybe aren't, you know, they're inside the scope of a park. Right. Um, when, when, what do we do there? That is now standard. We, if you want, we can share with you our new design guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a project in a flood prone area, staff has to look at those guidelines and design accordingly and it's very specific on what the location is, and you would enjoy the, actually it's a, a well done document that is very specific mm. in terms of how staff will design given the location of that park. So how do we look at things like solar panels to you know, run the bathrooms more effectively so they has their own, you know, in, without having to use electricity or oil, you talked a little bit about that in your testimony, right? But when do we sort of click on those thought processes when doing renovations? We're doing it now. Uh, right now is project specific. We're looking to put uh, panels, for example, in a parking lot in Brooklyn. Uh, we have green roofs on many of our projects, uh, so we're looking more and more to use uh, those options. Uh, so we're open to it. We're definitely open. If you have a suggestion or where you'd like to have that, we'll certainly take a look at it. All right, great. Let me take a look at my time. All right, I still got more. All right. Yep, yep, uh, I, won't say, I won't say my last name again. Um, so looking at Astoria Park, uh, we are very excited about uh, the phases of the Anchor Park program, and it's always great to see Astoria Park on the screen there as part of the Anchor Park. Uh, but looking at the pool in the long term, uh, and I was interested in putting capital uh, into it, and it's, it's, we're trying to get a sense of how we look at these projects, you know, these sort of larger projects that aren't part of Anchor Park that are way larger than someone that a council member could do themselves or even a borough president can do, talking about in the tens of millions of dollars. How do we even get to a figure? Like if we don't know where the, the end of the, the, the map is, you don't know where you're going. So how do we even start thinking about those larger projects? Internally, we always look at our capital needs. Uh, we have a very, very long list. It's pages. And each year, we sit down with OMB and the mayor's office, and we have to prioritize these needs against all the capital improvements citywide. Uh, we recognize there's a need uh, in Storia Pool uh, is an item on our list. I think we did some pre-scoping with OMB. So it's something we recognize need to be addressed. 
we just don't have the capital dollars at this point, but it doesn't mean that at one point in the future uh, it won't get funded. So we know some of the big capital items. It's just that there is no capital dollars. So we have hard dollars. We know how much it would cost to do some of the building, to do the basin. We have those numbers? Uh, I don't know if we have those numbers. We can get back to you, but I do know we did a pre-scoping with OMB just to get a sense of what is needed at a story pool. Because like once you have a, you know, once you know how much something is, you can say, okay, we have to start putting together well, the pieces. It's going to be a large number. That <laughs> that much I know. Is. I mean, yes. it may be something where you know, if I were to put a million dollars a year in for every, and, and my and my successor and my successor after that, right? I mean, so but, the pool infiltration but, system alone right. is eighteen million. Infiltration system Just alone. Just the pool infiltration is eighteen million. That's putting aside repairs to the to the building itself or the pool. Okay, I'm, I'm very concerned also about the bathrooms and, and the locker rooms, which are not in good condition. But I'm worried that it, even if I were to put dollars up, the other challenges within the building would preclude me from ever even getting to fix those bathrooms and, and locker rooms. So I, I'd love to sort of talk with you Understood. and see if we can figure out how we can carve that up to make it into maybe manageable chunks to get things done that, w that would have a real impact for the residents. Well, well We'll have our staff circle back with you to talk a little bit more about Astoria Pool and the surrounding area. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your timing was almost perfect. You get an A-. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr. Jonai. Uh-oh, you go for the A. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Chairs. Um, because I represent New York City's largest park, I hope I get a little overtime. Uh, the borough of the Bronx is known as the borough of parks. You ask the right questions to get more time. There you go. <laughs> so let me begin, Commissioner, with while I go through my other questions, if you could start looking at the headcount by borough on maintenance, and I'm going to ask you a few other questions. Um, in particular, the $8.7 million for tree pruning. What is the process? Please just walk me through this quickly. Because I understand there's a seven-year wait period. This recent storm, which mm -hmm took out uh, power to homes for days on end, if not over a week, uh, has been uh, pretty much the blame of trees that have toppled over or pulled down power lines. So please well, walk me through first, this. First, the seven year is a pruning cycle, which is the industry standard on how you should prune a tree. So your tree, every seven years, should be pruned. Prior to the Mayor de Blasio coming on board, that pruning cycle was 10 years. With additional funding, we brought it down to seven. So that's just the pruning primarily for branches. The stump removal is something else. Uh, and if there's other specific... No, not stump. We're talking about... Yeah. So this is the pruning cycle that your, your tree should be inspected and pruned every seven years. That is the current industry standard, and that's what we're doing now in parks. This last storm was a tragedy. It impacted so many homes. It did. Thousands were left without power. And it was solely because of trees. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Obviously, 10 years bringing it to seven is a tremendous accomplishment, but we're not doing enough to trim these trees down before they take down our power lines. They jeopardize the health and safety of our residents, pri personal property, private property. Um, I, I, from the date that a complaint comes in of a tree that's a, danger, a dangerous condition, what is the period of time before that tree is either steps are taken or an inspection or the grading? Uh, our goal is to inspect every service request we receive within 30 days. Of course, if a tree is identified as being potentially hazardous, uh, we expedite those, those reviews. Our response is based on the assessment that's made by the forester. Uh, but to answer your question about trees and power lines, uh, our staff does not work around power lines. Con Edison is required to remove any branches that, uh, that interfere or grow into their power lines. They have contractors who do that work uh, throughout the year. And when a windstorm occurs and a tree is damaged and it causes damage to the power lines, Con Edison has the responsibility for either addressing the, the hazard in the wires or shutting down the power so our staff can safely address the emergency. What is the wait period from a point where a tree is assessed to be hazardous before it is actually cut down or removed? Or if a tree is, is judged to be a hazard, and that's based on an inspection by a qualified forester, our goal is to address the hazard, whether it's removing the tree or cutting down the damaged portion of the tree, within seven days. 
That's your goal. That's our but goal. But I understand that there's trees that wait for years on end to be addressed. There are trees that, uh, that are not addressed immediately, but if that's the case, it is because a qualified forester has assessed the condition and has judged it not to be hazardous. So if a score was given to a tree almost 20 years ago, that score would progressively get worse, but yet no action has been taken to address the hazardous condition of this tree. Uh, I wouldn't say that's the case. We will reinspect the tree, uh, uh, you know, if the condition changes, or if, if, you know, if we ourselves, when we evaluate trees, we sometimes decide that we need to look at the tree again within a year. But if someone has a service request or they think the condition has changed, because it does, there were trees that were damaged in the recent storm that were fine a month ago that now have some damage, we will go out and inspect it within that 30-day period. And again, if it is the, uh, an extreme hazard, we'll address it within seven right. days. Let me, let me ask these questions quickly. What about the damage to sidewalks and concrete uh, due to tree roots? Uh, there are two sort of aspects to that. We have what's called the Trees and Sidewalk Program, through which we repair sidewalk damage that's caused by trees for tax class one properties. That's a one, two, and three family owner-occupied homes. Uh, that's been going on for What well is the over wait time for a replacement of or correction of a cracked sidewalk due to tree roots? Uh, that can vary greatly uh, because due to the severity of the damage, because we do rate each sidewalk, we deal with the, uh, the most severely damaged sidewalks first, and then, you know, we've had difficulty uh, uh, finding the, the right contractors to do this work. We certainly have a problem there. We need to address it. I'm going to take my colleague's time, if you don't mind. He has no questions. You, one of the 501 million... $501.9 million that was referred to for rat mitigation zones and at Big Belly trash cans. What is the price that we are currently paying for Big Belly trash cans and steel trash cans? Uh, I'm not aware of the unit cost unless, I'm not aware of the unit cost, but we can get back to any unit cost unless you know, Commissioner. Uh, the Big Belly's uh, cost uh, with a service contract included, uh, between four and five thousand dollars, and the steel can, the steel trash receptacles cost about six hundred dollars. Very good. So, with the, considering the priorities that we have and the limited resources that we have, why in God's name would we spend five thousand dollars on a garbage can when a steel garbage can serves the same purpose? Based, there are some areas uh, through various studies where there are rat reservoirs, and it's a significant problem. This is from the experts found out that the big bellies, which contain the trash, uh, is one of the ways of cutting off this food source for rats. Uh, the city is committed to finding uh, resources and approaches that are most effective, and the big bellies are one of them, uh, including the steel cans that we don't see a lot of theft of our steel cans, but we want to make sure we cut off the food supply of rats where there are very prominent rat reservoirs in our city, that's mm -hmm. a big problem. Thank you, Commissioner, but in my home, my grandmother says a steel can with a lid works just as fine, but I'll leave that to you and your better judgment. Yeah, very The million-dollar plant, and as my grandmother would say, it's easier to buy than to hold on to. You've reached 620,000 trees that are planted. We have the problem with the tree plume, the sidewalk repair. Um, you are taking away valuable open space, Pelham Parkway, our central park. Um, the open space that was once used for fields and sports and whatnot is no longer available. It is a disservice to those residents that have been using the, that parkway for decades. And I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Um, 30 Point Park, lack of investment, uh, tremendous park. There's some incredible scenery there on the water, lack of investment. Uh, I hope that you're going to pay a priority to it as well as Pelham Parkway, the preserving of our trees and that beautiful landscape that has been written about and stories have been told and books have been written about. We need to preserve those trees. Uh, we are doing a massive renovation there and reconstruction of the parkways. Uh, it has become a concern for all of my constituents and I wanna be mindful that we don't cut any unnecessary trees down there. And the last part of my question was the headcount by borough. No, no, is, this there, is there an Albanian word for chutzpah? Yes. I, I, I took my colleague in Riverdale. They don't need parks. We're okay. 
um, headcount by borough. The we can share the numbers with you, uh, but very quickly, uh, we work very closely with First Deputy and our Chief Operating Officer to make sure there's proper headcount on maintenance and Evan. I'll do the high number, not the low. Uh, in Bronx, 1,058. Brooklyn, 1,455. Manhattan 1240, Queens 1325, and Staten Island 464. That's the high end number. There's a low number, but that's on our peak. I'm not even sure where those numbers are coming from. The numbers I have here, considering the borough of the Bronx, just one park is 2,700 acres, three times larger than Central Park. And the number of full time employees that I was given were 363 for the borough of the Bronx, 445 for the borough of Manhattan. I'm sorry, Brooklyn, Manhattan 410, Queens 512, and Staten Island 230. Uh, again, we're at the lowest, and this is full-time employees. They have season right. and they have total. And the numbers that I have show only 799 employees for the entire borough of the Bronx. Well, and we Chief, have our more numbers, parkland than any right. other borough. We include seasonals, and then we also include our pop workers. We'll share the numbers with you. Please keep in mind we assess the usership and the type of park assets. An acre to an acre is not comparable. They're very different borough to borough. And so we make sure we right size and have the staff to take care of the type of park on a per acre basis. So it's not a park acre by acre, it's the park type acre by acre. But we'll share you the new numbers. I'm trying to, it's, his, it's him. He takes too long to answer the question. Certainly it's fascinating, <laughs> Mr. Jonah, I do, and I appreciate it. Less. Less. We'll continue this. I, I thank you for your brevity today. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Cohn. Uh, I have traditional Jewish chutzpah, but I'll try to be, uh, be brief. You know, I had to laugh though when you were testifying because I do remember your first hearing uh, and uh, we've traveled a, a long way together. And I, I do want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the good work, you know, the backlog. I, I, I've had at least one backlogged project that we, uh, that you and I worked closely together to, uh, to keep alive and get back on track. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Uh, and you know what a big fan I am of my borough commissioner, that she's been a tremendous partner and we've worked together so closely on a number of, uh, a number of issues. Uh, but uh, you also know that I've had enormous frustration around the capital process and I know that progress has been made and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. But uh, in your testimony, and I quote, there are significant portions of the capital process that lie outside of our agency's control. But uh, we've had that, that's been, your testimony for, you know, I guess this is the fifth year. What are we doing about trying to do something about the things? We're not completely powerless. The, you know, the mayor goes to Albany. You know, we need to make some changes here in the pro capital process. And I think that you've done everything in your power. So I want to know what is our plan and what have you done to try to get help? Well, with the administration, we now have uh, new deputy mayors. There is now a new focus on the operations side. Uh, we, want, we want to work with now the capital subcommittee as well. Uh, Mox did make some innovations, creating passport. So on the procurement side, some things have been done. There's more to do. And both our staff as well as the administration with the support of council will start looking at those other items we gave the chairs, both chairs of, uh, of the subcommittee capital and parks an insight about the issues in procurement that need to be addressed. That's where the focus needs to be on procurement. I think you understand that as well. And so we're determined to keep moving forward to improve the procurement process so we can move the projects a lot quicker. But uh, there are things, you know, again, these external factors. What, I mean, you know, I hear design bill talked about for NYCHA. I hear design bill talked about for DOT. I don't hear anybody talking about it for parks. Design bill really works for larger projects. It would not work for parks. Plus, right now, we're enjoying a lot of community participation. Design bill will take the community, for the most part, out of that process, something that we don't really think would be a good thing to do. But there are other ways that we can uh, expedite the process, but a lot of that focus on procurement. I was watching New York One, I think, last week, and the mayor was talking about the capital process, and he was talking specifically about SCA and holding it up as a model of you know, an agency that seems to do well uh, capital projects, and I know I've asked you in the past, and I know theoretically you, you you think it's an interesting idea, but in terms of a parks construction authority, could you just talk about if you think that there is application for that at parks, uh, freeing you up from, you know, as example, uh, Lorraine Grillo talked about freedom from Wix and some other things. Well, well, as you know, you and I had conversation about this. We remain open to have this conversation. Uh, I, I do know it's something introduced. Uh, and want to continue having a dialogue. I'm interested in having that dialogue with you. There are certainly pros and cons uh, about that approach, uh, but I look forward to that conversation. Uh, I hear your frustration. 
Uh, I think I've shared some of my concerns with you. And so it would be a good conversation to have going forward about what would be the best to expedite our projects moving forward. You know, I have one last question. In this vein, um, I know that uh, my borough president cares deeply about Orchard Beach. Uh, and when I have conversations sort of privately with people about the idea of a PCA, I believe that there are, there are landmark issues at uh, Orchard Beach. Am I correct on that? The answer is yes. I mean, I, I imagine that, I, that we could do a design or a plan that would be sensitive to the, uh, the architecture and design. Yeah, we will without having to subject, you know, if you were not subject, though, to landmarks, we could come up with, it would, I would imagine, save a significant amount of money. Yeah. Going to landmarks, uh, it is about a one- or two-month process. It wouldn't be onerous, but certainly any project that is landmarked, we use extreme sensitivity and make sure we consult with them before, and this is in the case of the EDC, uh, and their designer before they go too far our guess is not to alter this Robert, Robert Moses gem. No, I, and again, I would not advocate altering it, but uh, as uh, you know, in my council district, there are landmark districts, and I know the owners talk about the significant additional expense, even on the private sector, to trying to comply with landmarks. I see, I see, okay. And I'm concerned about, again, if, you know, you know, SCA does not have to comply with landmarks, and I, I'm not saying that we should disregard and I think Orchard Beach has the potential to be beautiful again. I think it is a, an iconic design and one that should be protected. But I, I wonder if we, if we could work around landmarks, if it's just one more opportunity to get the job done faster and more cost efficiently. So that's something, again, a, a plug on this front. Thank you. Right, thank you. Wow, that was great timing. Uh, <laughs> um, Mr. <laughs> I was born in the Bronx. I had a little benefit. Uh, we will be holding, just, just for your information, I, I plan to be holding along with Chair Gibson, um, Chair Torres of Oversight and Guidance, and probably Mr. Brannon of Contracts hearings later this year on procurement and how we can all work together. I've been meeting toward that goal with many, many people, some of whom are in this room. I've met uh, with Deputy Commissioner Braddock. And I will be holding more meetings before I get ready to hold these hearings. So I appreciate your input on that. I do sincerely believe that they are doing the best they can, with, with, but there are severe limitations to, what, to improving the process. I think in many respects we are victims of the rules that we put in place to protect <laughs> ourselves. So here, here. Okay. <laughs> you could do that. I think we all agree on that. And I think what we do want, um, we all want the best for our parks users. and. I think this will spill over into other areas of um, capital construction as well. That being said, I am now uh, happy to introduce the former chair of the Parks Committee, uh, my friend Mark Levine. But you, you don't get extra time for being a former chair. I'm just warning you now. Uh, I'll try and follow the example set by Councilmember Cullen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, wonderful to be back and wonderful to see all of you. Uh, the Chair and I and the Commissioner spoke at a conference this morning to the incredible men and women who maintain our parks, the gardeners uh, particularly, who are so important to the health of the system. Uh, we can spend billions on capital, but if we walk away without adequate maintenance, it's all for naught. Um, uh, so that leads into my question about the fate of 150 gardeners and maintenance workers. Uh, this is an issue that um, we've gone back and forth on now for three budget cycles in a row. Um, they are so critical to um, maintenance of particularly parks in the CPI portfolio. Uh, this is not an example of a pet project of the council, which um, is a goal the administration doesn't share. Uh, I think this is an a goal that, that you share as deeply as we do. Um, Am I right that there was no funding for these 150 uh, men and women in the mayor's preliminary budget? And in the preliminary if not, budget, you are correct. Why not? Uh, this budget uh, basically did not include any of the baselines from previous years, which is why it went down to 501. Uh, and as you know, uh, as we've had discussions in years past, uh, this is the beginning of the budget process. Uh, at this point, uh, those positions were not put in. Uh, I'm optimistic as it goes forward uh, that we'll continue both the city and OMB to work with council to see what we can do to address these positions. But for the time being, they're currently not in the preliminary budget. 
I implore you to do everything you can to get them into the exact budget and that you not assume that the council continue to pick up what is a very, very heavy load considering the total pot of funding that we have in a year where things are a little bit tighter and there's a lot competing. Um, none of us can assume that the council will, for the fourth year in a row, come in and save the day. This really, by rights, is the kind of thing that the Park Department should fund, that the administration should fund. So I really implore you to do everything you can to fight internally uh, whatever battles you have to fight to make sure that um, these men and women continue in employment come Jan July 1st for their good and for the good of the park system. Um, shifting gears to um, uh, a capital-related question, the topic of the park's capital tracker, uh, which uh, you justifiably uh, should feel proud of, bringing some light and transparency to the capital process um, by creating a website for every single ongoing parks capital project. Um, I noticed very curiously, I think, a step backwards in transparency on the way we list the cost of projects that used to list the amount of the cost and now gives a range. I was just looking right a few minutes ago to Bloomingdale P Playground in my district, which now the cost is listed from $3 million to $5 million. Uh, I'm told by our Deputy Commissioner that we give a range because we don't want to tell the exact price of the contractor, so we're given a range of what it could be. Uh, that way it allows it to be competitively responded to. Uh, so that's the reason why it's given a range, not an exact figure. So once you've accepted a bid from the contractor, then you post? Then we post the actual then, uh, Yes, I'm told the answer is yes. Is it not public information the, or without this website what the budgeted amount for the project is? I mean, it's in budget documents. Reported, we can list the price. Mm -hmm. But we pass our budget. We pass our budget in, in late June, and uh, I believe that there is uh, detail in that document that would uh, lay out the amount budgeted for every discrete project, no? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, if you repeat the question, I apologize. If we can, okay, 53 seconds. If you repeat the question. Uh, uh, I, oh, no. <laughs> okay. I, I, I understand not wanting to tip our hand to people who are bidding about what our bottom line is. I get that. But the Parks Tracker is kind of an afterthought when we've already published that in budget documents, have we not? If someone is, wants to go into the budget and try to figure things out, they can. But from our purpose, we do prefer... Uh, on the capital tracker to put that range until it's awarded than to put in that figure. But were you anecdotally getting reports of contractors that weren't savvy enough to go to the budget documents than just going to the Parks Capital Tracker? Okay. Uh, I, I, I have only a few seconds left. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you about a, a pet issue of mine, which is how we understand the start date of capital projects and how that's reflected on the Parks Capital Tracker, which would appear calls the initiation of design as the start date for the project. Um, why not just tell the world when we funded it, when it was fully funded? I mean, that, that's what the public... We uh, do say when it's fully funded. In terms of how we start, what we do, the official start date is when we hold the public meeting. Uh, as I said in the past, you, you can't have all the planes fly at one time. It's very difficult. So we look at staff, a staff availability by borough and then assign them a park project until we complete our queue for that year. Uh, so we do know what year it was funded. It's on every project we give the year date, but the start date is when we have that first public meeting, and that's when the design clock starts ticking. Right, when, when the first, you, you're starting the clock at the first public meeting? Correct. So not even when you assign staff internally to the work, to the first, project? But that, that would be the obvious moment, right? You have a capital staffer who's assigned to the project. It's almost done simultaneously, uh, but our goal is when the first public meeting is the kickoff is when the project actually starts. No work has been done. We set up the public meeting, and then we get the public input to influence the conceptual design. So the per public meeting, which we hold for all capital projects, is the kickoff start date for the project. Okay. I'm, I'm now in chutzpah categories, so uh, territory, so I will, I will wrap up okay. and just say that um, <laughs> we... We continue to struggle with a mismatch between the way the department accounts for timing and the way the public, which is who we serve, understands timing. 
And as soon as we fund a park renovation project, it's going to be in the newspaper. It's going to be in our email blasts. Uh, it's, the public at that point becomes excited, and, and in their minds, they're, they're, they're starting the stopwatch. We understand, and if you recall, I made a commitment that in the years past, we had some 30, 40 projects from that fiscal year that we couldn't even assign. We're now dropping that number in half, in some cases to 10, and so our goal is for that fiscal year to get all those projects assigned, but it does take time between the fiscal year. Sorry, so that was 30 projects that didn't start within a year of the funding? Over to the right. next year. Well, We're now bringing that number down because we can move the projects and assign them quicker, but we understand the council member said I funded it. Uh, it may be October, November, December before it officially starts, but our commitment is to get it started that fiscal year and to keep that number down to those that have to be carried to the next year to a minimum. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, we are now to the furthest reaches of the City of New York, the southern border of the State of New York, Mr. Borelli. Thank you, Barry. Give him five and a half minutes, please. It's a yeah. nice borough. I need it. I need the head start. And thank you, Commissioner. And I, I just want to point out our, our borough commissioner and our chief of staff and our wonderful Staten Island team are here. Uh, and uh, the things I asked you last year was to get some of the projects that were on the, in the queue going. And I think they've actually done a really good job uh, this year. And my issue has always been sidewalks. And when we're having some scuttlebutt with some people on the other side of the building and some people around various agencies. The response I always got was that, you know, the cost of labor has gone up, um, the, the cost of nearly everything gone up. So I actually spoke to some people in labor, and together we picked a random project from the Parks Department, and we looked at some of the costs. And the one we picked was the Morris Jumel Mansion Streetscape. Uh, and I have, I have actually, I have to confess, I have no idea where it is. I've absolutely, I've never been there. I live three blocks. Oh, great, there. yeah. Yes. So you, you, got a new, you got a new sidewalk and a new wall, according to what the Parks Department uh, said was the scope of the project, and some ADA accessible ramps. And the budgeted amount was $1.35 million. And if we take the 10% off, we get to one25 like two five, let's say. Uh, and then we pulled the labor records, all the payroll, and we found that the labor cost was $290,000. That's how much was actually paid to workers from that project. So the, I, the question I, I guess I want to ask, and it's along the same lines as what Councilmember Cohen and, and some others have asked, is where does that extra, in this case, $950,000, and that's, that's about 65, 70 percent of the total money allocated, is it going up, is there a profit Obviously, that there's a percentage of that. Is there materials, et cetera? Where, where does the rest of that go? Well, we did our own calculation based on your inquiry, and it turns out that we calculated that 40 percent of the cost is going to labor. We're going to do a further study in general to see how much of our projects is labor and materials. Uh, but for that one, and our staff can meet with you to go over our numbers, mm -hmm. but in fact, for that specific project, 40 percent of that project was labor, uh, not to 21 percent. Is that, were there a change of work orders along the way? Is that, is that why the, the, the cost went up? Uh, no. no. We'll, we'll sit down with you to go in more detail, but now this had triggered me, which I had asked for before, but it is looking at, on average, what is the split on our projects, getting to the concern about cost between labor and materials. This one, because it was a specific question, we looked into and found out that it was 40%. Uh, when, when it's things like cement that, that we are buying, whether it's this project or a multitude of projects, is that something that the contractor bids and purchases on his or her own, or is that something we buy in bulk and then they, they use? Okay. Well, let me, uh, Ms. Braddock is, uh, Commissioner Braddock is head of capital projects, so I'll defer Thank that you. question to her. Sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? Please? So, in other words, if, if we have a project, the uh, Jamel Mansion Streetscape project, uh, in Council Member Levine's district, and we have another project that's doing sidewalks uh, in Queens. Do, does each individual contractor still bid, and in their, in their bidding documents, they provide the cost that they estimate for the cement, et cetera? In other words, are they purchasing each c bunch of cement separately? Yes. So the fact that we are the biggest purchaser of cement maybe in the city at, at various times doesn't impact the, the cost we get 
on the, the price. On the individual, that's, that's absolutely correct, because they're doing it on an individual project by project basis. Um, have you guys ever looked at sort of expanding, I, I guess, maybe requirements contracts to, 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 to be suppliers to, to cut the cost? Oftentimes what we'll do is in a borough by borough basis, if you're doing a similar project where you're doing just sidewalks or just paving, you bundle those sites together so that you can get a greater cost efficiency. So the answer in that question, to that question is yes. Okay, good. Yeah, it's, we, we have some tot lots that are bundled together. That's good. Um, when contractors bid on the project, are they, are they including the cost of insurance for their workers in the bid? Yes, those things are required as part of the contract in order to do business with the City of New York. So the start date on the contract was July 2014, and the completion date was 2016. But the payrolls for the project only go from uh, the end of July to mid-August, leaving almost a six, seven-month gap between when there was when the contractor was saying no one was actually working and when the the project was signed off. Does the contractor factor in the cost of the insurance on those employees for that period of time? They have to carry the insurance for the duration of the contract. So, just in theory, we're paying. We're reimbursing the contractor to pay insurance on individuals who are not employed at the job site. And they have to carry it again. They just, I guess the answer would be yes, because they have to carry the insurance all the way through until there is what's called the final inspection right. and it's turned over to the city. Um, I, I don't want to be too specific with the project because I, I don't expect you to have the answer to everything. But I mean, is, is this a normal thing where, where work ends and then it's not till seven months later where there's a final sign off? No, that is not normal at all. At all, there were definitely issues with this particular contractor at this site okay. that caused that gap, which we're happy to explain to you in a different setting. Do we pick a bad project? <laughs> you picked a bad contractor. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Borelli. Um, I hope Ms. Rosenthal's on her way back. She had to be across the street. Um, Ms. Gibson, or would you like me to go for it? Um, following up, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, I almost cut your salary there. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ku was worried about um, availability of cell phone signal in, in parks. And um, I'm wondering uh, right now, um, can you provide us with a figure that uh, the par parks revenue figures, and if you don't have them today, I would appreciate it if you could forward them to us, um, for mobile pole top telecommunications franchisees, what they pay the city of New York to the Department of Parks? Does that revenue come to your agency or? Our revenue division, I can certainly respond to that. I do know uh, AT&T, uh, I think, I forgot what the other company was called, I think now is Spectrum. We can certainly supply you with that information. There are different arrangements uh, per park, uh, but we can certainly supply you uh, with that, that data. And do you think there's an opportunity reasonably to grow revenue for parks within parks, uh, providing the cell pro providers? We don't, obviously don't want to overrun our parks with cell phone towers, but... I think, yeah, each arrangement is different, and so I don't want to speak out of turn. We would like to follow up to share with you uh, the agreement between AT&T and through Spectrum, I believe, for example, AT&T, it is free for the user, those that use Spectrum. If you are a customer, if I think the first amount of time is free and then it will charge you uh, compared to other free Wi-Fi that may penetrate into a park, I'd rather uh, sit down with staff and get you the information to know what parks are covered and, uh, and, and what the arrangement is uh, for each franchise. Okay. And have you... I'm told I met with people and it evinced my curiosity. Uh, have there been problems in, in procuring these or securing these kind of contracts with different companies or just uh, case by I case? I guess it's something exclusive with our revenue division and probably also with the law department at the city. So I would uh, would like a chance to follow up with our revenue division okay. uh, to get back to you on, on those. I that would appreciate that information. Um, we were this morning at. Um, the horticulture conference, and it was wonderful. And so that provoked a question from me, and 
Uh, and I spoke about it this morning, but I'd like to ask you on the record now. Uh, the Green Streets, which Commissioner Stern started, um, they're wonderful, and they really are a tremendous help, um, not only in greening up our city, but certainly reducing the heat islands around the city because we've taken tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of square feet of concrete and turned them into um, parks, um, not necessarily passive parks, but still parks, and they're havens for some wildlife and, and insects. Um, can we see additional dollars for that? We'd love to expand it in certain parts of Queens. We'd like to add additional, but I'm told that the funding just isn't there for parks to do it. Correctly. Funding isn't there. Again, these are unique sites for gardeners and staff to maintain. Uh, some DOT has to maintain on certain uh, thoroughfares. Uh, right now, it's not in the budget to expand the program. Uh, if there are some ideas about where you'd like to expand it, let us know. When, but for the time being, um, we just want to make sure the ones that we have, because as you know, these are very discrete areas and parcels uh, that staff has to go in and clean and maintain. Uh, but, but if you have some ideas and locations, let us know. But right now, there is no budget uh, to, uh, to, to expand the Green Streets. Is what locations we I certainly have, and I understand the funding challenges. One thing I was wondering is if maybe if we did some of the larger ones, um, I have some sites near Hillside Avenue that um, are large, close to an acre. All that water is currently going into our city sewer system. So I'm wondering maybe we could you could look at and agreeing with DEP, we would take some of the water off their hands and maybe they could help with funding. Just a thought that I had today. Okay, so I would definitely follow up Commissioner Lewandowski and then we'll okay. sit down and see what is possible. Thank you very, very much. Um, Ms. Gibson, Chair Gibson. Just to close us out, um, yet, Commissioner, in your testimony, you talked about the uh, Anchor Parks Initiative. Very excited about that, the $150 million and focusing on the larger parks in each borough. So our park in the Bronx, it's not in my district, but I'm still taking credit. It's St. Mary's Park. It's fine because my constituents go all over the place. Um, so you said that the projects are on time in terms of design and other um, Correct. Parts of the process. There's two phases. Phase one right now should okay. be completed by 2020. 2020? Yes. No phase 1A, right? Just one? <laughs> phase one, phase two. Okay, phase one and phase two. Okay. Just making sure. The large park, so we wanted to get something in the ground quickly. Right. Okay, so I guess my question is looking big picture. Um, if this is a successful initiative that we anticipate it to be, um, once we get to 2020, do you think that there is a potential to look at other larger scale parks for a continuation or expansion of the initiative? Is that any talk just yet? It's always a desire. We have okay. to look at the, uh, the financial situation of the city at that time. The Community Parks Initiative, very successful. Parks Without Borders, very successful. Mm -hmm. And Anchor Parks. Uh, we had record number of people coming out to the community meetings. And so the answer is the desire is yes to expand this. We have many parks. The goal of Anchor Parks is to make old parks new again. And so that is a goal of mine. I'm sure the council shares that goal as well. But we'll have to look at the capital budget situation at that time. But it's certainly something that's on the table we would like to expand if it's a priority that we have funds to actually expand that program. Okay. Um, earlier when we talked about standardizing the design for comfort stations, I wanted to ask if Parks is looking at any other part of the design phase that you want to streamline a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So I do understand, and I'm one of those community folks as well, we ask for everything. When you come to us and you say we have this amount of money, you have ideas on what type of park you want to see, there are many, many ideas people come up with. Right. What I've appreciated about what Parks has done in my district is with the, you know, acreage we have and with the land we have in parks, we're able to achieve different amenities for different age ranges. The playground equipment for the babies, the basketball equipment for teenagers, and the new addition, which I really love, is the fitness equipment. I have it at Cedar Park that we opened a year ago, and that's a great example. So what I'm seeing moving forward is that has been the typical model of most yes. of my parks in the Bronx. However, and I ask this question because there are instances 
instances where when we start with scoping and we get the ideas, the parks has an idea of what that project is going to cost, but when you get back to the community, the design is usually done, and there could be a change in the design that will change the cost of the project. So is there any talk about looking at streamlining any other part of the design of parks? Well, a couple of things. One, we now have moved away from customized design. Okay. We have manufacturers. If we can't purchase it from a manufacturer, we're not going to have something customized and built. It's hard to maintain, uh -huh. and the cost goes up. So if you notice right now, to move these projects forward, we have manufacturers for play units, for adult fitness equipment, mm -hmm. uh, safety surface, that that is what we now prefer. When we look at the budget, very often, if it goes over budget, we have two choices. We don't like to go back to the council member. You always know when we say that's not popular Unless to do. you have to. We say whether we have <laughs> funds that we can uh, put to the budget or we have to do value engineering to take certain elements out. So those are the choices. We try to uh, design for the budget, but then when we go out to bid, that's when we find out right. once the contractors respond, what we thought would be 3.1 is now 3.4, and we have to make a decision what we do to proceed. We go back to the council member, we see if we can, something we can do, but that is in almost every project. But first and foremost, no more custom design. We purchase what the manufacturer has, and that helps us streamline the process on the design side and also bring down costs, because we know how much the units cost. The labor is the X factor, but at least we know how much the unit cost. Right, okay. I, I appreciate that. I think I've experienced that when um, the Parks Department has come back to me a couple of times. But again, I really do appreciate it. And it's because we have so many advocates and residents that love parks, and we're all trying to accomplish everything. So I've been asked to look at therapeutic services for our parks and how we can incorporate other sorts of innovative approaches that really address seniors, those with disabilities, children with special needs, to make sure that essentially everyone is accommodated in one location. So right. um, I understand the challenge and I appreciate the efforts that have been undertaken to try to improve the process. So Councilmember Cohen asked a very specific question about Orchard Beach and I did want to get your um, take on where we are. We had a briefing with park staff about a year ago. Um, the Bronx elected officials, the borough president has been very, very passionate about Orchard Beach. And not only has he been passionate, but he has put his own money into Orchard Beach and assembled uh, our friends in the state legislature as well. Um, so I do know the commitment of 40 million that we have today are city dollars. Covenant, mm, yes. Not Yes, all city dollars? Okay, good. Um, yeah. But does that include the total amount for phase one? Because I understood that Orchard Beach has a massive um, series of renovations, um, probably 1A, 1B, and 1C. Um, but 40 million, I don't believe, is enough. So do you have an idea of what the phase one cost will be? Uh, it okay. would, there's a lot of work, I think we estimated. To be done, right. Either 70 or 100. It's, it is definitely more than 40 million. Okay. EDC is now in charge of the project. They expect design this summer. Uh, we will, our focus primarily is on the pavilion and ADA access. Right. Uh, as the designer comes on board, we'll get a better picture about what we could afford for the 40 million. This is an historic structure that requires significant restabilization, as well as stairs that will go down with ramps that will now, rather than going up steps, you can now enter at the grade level on the, on the promenade of the park itself. So design will be starting this summer. EDC will be the lead, and we're certainly open to as many meetings as possible for the electeds uh, to understand this project. Okay. But if you're saying in terms of the totality, it is a big park with a lot of needs and a beach with a lot of needs. Uh, phase, phase one really is a 40 million, and I know the borough president and others are interested in doing future phases to improve other assets on both sides of the pavilion. Okay, I agree. No, I think when we talked to him, he prioritized the pavilion and ADA um, accessibility. Um, it's very frequently used. I mean, there's salsa concerts. There's all sorts of things happening at Orchard Beach every year, um, which I appreciate because we want to continue to talk um, positively about the beauty and the treasures we have in the Bronx that a lot of people don't know about. So um, I'm happy to work with my colleagues and the bar president to continue to support that and just ask that you keep us posted um, as design is completed and we move to next phases and working with EDC, that will be helpful. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I wanna add my voice uh, 
We mentioned both of my parents' parks today, Crotona Park yes. and Orchard Beach. My mother used to take the bus up Pelham Parkway in the 1930s uh, to get to the beach. So, um, it, and it is a gem and it needs to be uh, polished. Um, I think with that, Mr. Commissioner and your staff, I would ask you one last thing, if you could introduce the borough commissioners that are here. I certainly know. I, uh, I'll just say their names, and hopefully all five are here. If they're not, I'm sure they have a good no, Ms. reason. No, Mr. not so here. First, I, oh, then I, thank you for that tip. So <laughs> from the island, Staten Island, we have Borough Commissioner Linda Ricadone. Uh, from the Bronx, we have Iris Rodriguez Rosa. Uh, Manhattan, Bill Castro. Mm -hmm. Not sure. From Brooklyn, Marty Marr. And of course, Dorothy Lewandowski. Okay. Uh, I do have one more question, though, and this is at the behest of a council member who uh, couldn't be here. Um, the freight elevator, this is going to Brooklyn. We didn't get any Brooklyn questions, and so elevator. we need one Brooklyn question. Um, the freight elevator at the Coney Island headquarters, which is on 25th Street, has been out for several years, and I am told that FEMA and capital funding have been requested but have not been allocated. And I would wonder if you could, if you have any information on that today. I am told that we do not have capital funding to repair it. Uh, staff is aware uh, and uh, will make note of it and will continue to, uh, at least I'll follow up to find out more about it. But uh, right now there's no capital funding to repair the freight elevator. Okay. Uh, we've been joined by my colleague, uh, Ms. Barron. You have any questions today, Ms. Barron? No. Okay. With that, Commissioner, I want to thank you for being here today. and. Uh, we certainly look forward to uh, working with you on the many issues. You happen to be commissioner of what is probably the most popular agency in the city of New York. I've been told. And you, you will henceforth be known as the commissioner of Parks and Recreation, Fun, Health, and Happiness. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all for the good. And we look forward to seeing you again in May. Uh, I will see some of your staff probably in April. but. Um, but that's another few weeks away. So thank you, and with that, um, we will get to the panels now. If any of uh, anybody's arrived uh, after we started this hearing and they would like to testify, uh, please see the Sergeant at Arms and fill out a form. We're going to take a two-minute break. To let the uh, to let parks.
the party continue. All right, we can have fun, but we can't have that much fun. Um, the first panel, Roxanne Delgado from Friends of Pelham Parkway, Heather Lubov from the City Parks Foundation, and Michael Schnall from the New York Roadrunners. And Lynn Kelly, from New Yorkers for Parks. I've been. We have set the clock for three minutes. Since I'm the only member here left, I don't really care if you go a little over, but the people following you may care, but uh, that's okay. Now let me thank you for being here today, and if we could go in the order I called you, so Ms. Delgado. Hello, hi. Hello, Chair. My name is Roxanne Delgado. I am here on behalf of Pelham Parkway, located in the northeast of the Bronx. I know it well. Okay, and in the 13th District of the City Council. Our parkway is over 108 acres, which is less than one half of 1% 1 of the par city park's total parkland. Yet the parkway takes, makes a huge impact on the property value of our neighborhood, as well as it improves our quality of life. Friends of Parkway was formed last year in June, and we have done cleanups every month since then. We do um, tabling alongside with our cleanups. We have meaningful conversations with our neighbors and residents of, and users of the parkway. And we can't help note the heavy use of the parkway by both residents and visitors. Due to the heavy use, there is lots of litter and there is lots of wear and tear on our parkway. This is why I was so disappointed that the park's overall budget was decreased by over 10%. I was also disappointed that over 1.2% was decreased from maintenance and operation. Much of the decrease was due to 90 per seasonal jobs eliminated. During the late spring and summer is when we have lots of people on the parkway and we need park enforcement and park rangers to interact with the users on following the park rules, including not barbecuing or littering on our parkway. The city is spending millions to upgrade neglected parks, but the city should be more proactive and maintain the parks before they become neglected and need to be overhauled. Last year, maintenance operation was 309 million, and the city parkland is over 30,000 acreage, which means that the city spends a little over 10,000 per acreage. For the public trust land report, parkland is over 25,000 per acreage. But I don't need data to prove my point. I live near the parkway for over 10 years, and I have witnessed the deterioration of our parkland and the lack of maintenance and enforcement. And my neighbors and users also relate those same sentiments during our interaction during our tabling. So I. I I would even suggest that we slow down the capital project and divert more funding to maintain our existing parkland. Thank you so much, Chair. I thank you. The, the, just so you know, the, um, the capital money comes from a different pot, so expense money is used eventually to pay off capital projects, but they are two different tracks of money that we do track here at the Council and, and are spent by um, the Parks Department. Um, we have the oversight there. I love Pelham Parkway. It's one of the most beautiful places in the city, and I actually played there as a little boy visiting my relatives, so, but I'm old. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for being a supporter of parks. Heather and I have become good friends <laughs> over the last couple of months. <laughs> Heather Lubov. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Heather Lubov, Executive Director of City Parks Foundation, a nonprofit organization that uses performing arts, sports, environmental education, and community building programs to bring people into parks. We believe that thriving, active parks play an essential role in creating vibrant and healthy communities. Thanks in part to the Council's support, this year we offered free sports instruction to 13,000 youth and seniors developed nearly 3,000 future park stewards through K-12 environmental education programs, and celebrated New York's diverse cultures through our Summer Stage Festival and the Traveling Puppet Mobile, reaching more than 280,000 audience members. We are, proud, we are proud to partner with NYC Parks on Partnerships for Parks, our community building program that supports a network of volunteer leaders who care and advocate for their local neighborhood parks. 
Partnerships for Parks supports more than 670 volunteer friends groups who help care for nearly 400 parks in all 51 council districts. To support these groups, Partnerships hosts more than 35 workshops attended by 450 volunteers, supports groups through community visioning projects, provides graphic design assistance, distributes thousands of dollars in small capacity building grants, and serves as a fiscal sponsor for more than 50 groups. These resources give volunteer park groups the tools and information they need to transform public spaces into dynamic community assets that strengthen the social fabric of our neighborhoods. The vast majority of these technical assistance resources are available because of funding from the City Council's Parks Equity Initiative. We thank the Council for making this work possible and respectfully request that you continue to support this work through the Parks Equity Initiative in fiscal 19. In exchange, Partnerships for Parks bring significant value to our city's green spaces, supporting, supporting and activating enormous volunteer resources. As you know, although volunteer time is technically donated, yes. it still has an important economic value, and it is that value that Partnerships for Parks helps unlock. By calculating the volunteer hours spent during It's My Park Service projects, and the equivalent value of time spent planning programs in neighborhood parks, including movie nights or family festivals, we estimate that volunteers are contributing almost $16 million worth of their own time and effort to help support and improve their local parks. Partnerships for Parks helps those volunteers reach their full potential, thanks to the Council's Parks Equity Initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you for your support for City Parks Foundation. And just refresh my memory, how much money do you get from the Parks Initiative and from local members, Jen? Uh, we receive $500,000 directly for our technical assistance support, and then through Council member initiatives, we received 609000 and change. So that's just over $1.1 but you're leveraging almost on a 16 to one basis, which is really wonderful. And yeah. I've seen the work that they've done uh, in some of my parks, including Cunningham. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you for getting those figures to us. Uh, Mr. Schnoll, I hope I got that pronunciation correct. correct huh? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Schnoll and I serve as Vice President of Youth and Community Relations at New York Roadrunners. As a former council staffer and parkey, it's an honor to testify before the Committee on Parks and Recreation on the FY19 preliminary budget. New York Roadrunner's mission is to help and inspire people through running. We achieve our mission by creating running and fitness opportunities and programming for people of all ages and ability. NYRR demonstrates its commitment to keeping New York City's five boroughs healthy through races, community events, youth initiatives, school programs, and training resources that provide hundreds of thousands of people each year with the motivation, know-how, and opportunity to run for life. We engage over 25,000 volunteers annually, providing free time, talent, and energy to keep our events safe and parks and communities clean and beautiful. Our free community running and walking initiative, NYR Open Run, is getting thousands of New Yorkers out running and walking weekly in 13 local New York City parks in all five boroughs, with three more par park sites set to open uh, very shortly. NYRR walks with over 2,300 seniors as part of our Striders walking program, and we serve as a resource and partner to public officials, community boards, business improvement districts, hospitals, community health organizations, and grassroots community groups. I'm sure you've heard that New York City Parks Commissioner Mitchell Silver, sitting behind us, will be running the T 2018 TCS New York City Marathon this coming November. <laughs> I hope that the New York City Council and this committee will join us in this annual celebration of our great city and our parks and the five boroughs by cheering on the commissioner on November 4th. For fiscal year 2019, New York Roadrunners respectfully asks the New York City Council to consider a request of $75,000 to support our free community running programs, Open Run, that, pr that presently serves in 13 parks, with three more on the way. With this 2019 request, we're hoping to continue to provide, at no cost, the organized and supportive environment that helps our weekly Open Run participants across New York City take the steps necessary to make fitness and wellness part of their daily life right in their own neighborhood parks. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I'm happy to take any questions, just and thank a, you for your support. Just a quick question. Your request for $75,000, are you currently receiving funding from the council? Last year we received about $90,000 in total uh, spread across 11 different council members and their, uh, their discretionary budgets, but nothing on the, uh, on the order of a central uh, funding uh, request in the past. The last time we received any money was uh, fiscal year 2017, and after that the obesity initiative that we were funded under was cut. Okay. 
Um, okay. There. Yes, go ahead. You know, I was, I was just thinking with the park's capital tracker, if the commissioner's going to run, we could put a commissioner tracker <laughs> on him over the course of the 26 miles. That's assuming he gets over the Verrazano Bridge. Yes. 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 Yeah, if, if you look at his Fitbit progression, I, um, I introduced him to the folks at Fitbit, and they were shocked at how much of a, a hardcore user he was. I think they had to go back and recalibrate their software to accommodate him. Always good to see. Um, I may have to put you up against the Queens Library director, uh, Mr. Walcott, who was, yeah, he's pretty good. Um, last person on this, thank you, Mr. Schnall. Um, Lynn Kelly, New Yorkers for Parks. Hi, good, good to afternoon. see you again. Hi, yes, yeah, nice to Started see you again. Started the day, I'm not quite ending the day with you. Uh, well, thank you for having me again, and thank you to the committee um, for the moment to testify. I am the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. Um, we are an independent advocacy organization for over 100 years um, advocating for parks and open space in New York City. Our advocacy is based on sound research and data and, com and community input. Um, last year, with the collective feedback gathered at our annual borough and citywide meetings, we created the Public Realm Bill of Rights. I've provided a copy to you today. This document has become the bedrock of our advocacy work, and simply put, we believe that parks are critical city infrastructure and thus should be maintained, funded, programmed, and planned for accordingly. To that end, we're very pleased to see that the city has added 20 new, 21 new full-time baseline positions for fiscal year 2019. This will certainly help uh, greatly with maintenance staff and our community parks initiative sites. We believe fixed maintenance staff, which is really one of the optimum staffing models when it's available, provides increased security within a park, extra eyes, and frankly, a familiar face to local residents. In tandem with these positions, we believe that baselining of 9.6 million by the city to retain the 150 workers and gardeners throughout the city is a critical addition. This is the fourth time in a row that my organization is here not just thanking the council for the replacement of these positions in a funding line, but urging the administration again to make this job line permanent. Um, here, here. Creating a pipeline is exactly, <laughs> clearly important. Um, to that end, we actually support a planned increase in hours and salaries for PEP officers, Parks Enforcement Control, and Urban Park Rangers. Uh, we're not sure if you know, but they create great paths for careers in the I Parks Department. I do know. I know that one of our former commissioners and uh, Mr. Benepe and our current Queens Commissioner, Ms. Lewandowski, both started together. Avenal. That was quite That's a class. Along. Yes. Um, and so we really feel that creating our Urban Park Rangers and creating a pipeline for Parks Department jobs is really important. Um, we're pleased to see the renewed allocation of approximately two and a half million uh, committed towards tree care, pr tree pruning and stump removal, particularly in the wake of so many recent storms. Um, on the capital side, one of the strongest statements Parks Department has made is its ongoing investment in community parks and anchor parks initiative. And we continue uh, to urge the council to support the administration in this effort in allocating money towards this. However, uh, we do remain concerned about the increasing time delays and mounting aggravation that all sides are feeling with respect to the capital projects process. It's not just the public, it's not just the council. I would say that the Parks Department themselves are also frustrated. Um, and I wanna say, and respectfully, Councilmember Cohen, after listening to your comments earlier, um, I think the Parks Department has really gone a long way in trying to address a lot of the capital projects process but we would encourage the council to look very carefully with the same zeal and vigor that you're looking at the Parks Department and their capital process. You should all to also look at the things that are outside of Parks' control that contribute to time delays, such as the Law Department, MOX, OMB, and frankly, the procurement process. And we would uh, encourage you not just to look at it, but have a dialogue about it as well. I can, I can tell you that I have had conversations with Speaker Johnson and he is a gung-ho about um, holding hearings on these, many of the issues that you raised. We realize that um, many of the problems are well outside of the purview of the Parks Department. As I said before, um, before the commissioner uh, was done testifying, uh, many of the things that we put in place to help ourselves are now uh, hurting us. So with an eye to the future, I, I wanna also thank you and Ms. Lubov, we've, we've met. Um, and I thank you for your input on these issues. And I have still meeting with people and getting their input, but those 
initial round of meetings are coming to an end, and then I'm going to decide uh, what our next steps will be. And I hope that all of you will be involved because um, it really is unfortunate uh, to be polite um, how long it takes us to get things done. And um, we have so many different uses in our parks. Uh, we could be here all day just talking about one or two of them, but um, it's just incredible. In my flagship park, Cunningham Park, we have everything from bocce to mountain biking. Um, and it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing um, what goes on in the New York City Parks Department. So I want to thank you for being here today. And I look forward to working with all of you going forward. And I will probably not be running in the marathon, but I will, <laughs> I will think about it. We okay. can get you. You have an open run in Cunningham, so you come on out. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. i got to lose you. some weight. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the next panel... Uh, Christina Taylor, Friends of Van Cortland Park, home of the oldest municipal golf course. I had to get golf in there somewhere today. Uh, <laughs> oldest golf course in the country. Uh, Karen Argenti and Laura Spader. Am I pronouncing that? Spalter, I'm sorry. I believe that you're all from the Bronx, correct? Yep. You all know this gentleman? Very well. Okay. <laughs> He's a good guy. Ms. Taylor, if you could begin, I would be very happy to hear your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm Christina Taylor, Executive Director for the Friends of Van Cortland Park, and I do need to start by thanking our Councilman Andrew Cohen, who has been very supportive of Van Cortland Park and all the parks in his district. We all know that New York City Parks is underfunded. They have been for many, many years, and this needs to change. The Friends would happily join you to urge the mayor to increase funding for New York City Parks. A few years ago, New York City Parks approved a comprehensive master plan for the first time in Van Cortland Park's history. However, that plan will never be accomplished in 20 years with the current rate in which projects are funded and implemented. Currently in Van Cortland Park, we have several capital projects that are in critical parts of the master plan in the works that are delayed for various reasons, including significant increases in costs fun since funding was originally secured. We also have several projects that are needed, but the estimates are so incredibly high that finding money for them will be nearly impossible. For example, we have a small wooden bridge on the popular John Kieran Trail, which is shared with the golf course. It's closed to pedestrians for safety reasons. Parks has estimated this to be a $2.5 million capital project, and that's just ridiculous. A project like this should not cost nearly this much or take three to five years to implement. The capital process is broken. In addition to increasing parks budget, we need to improve the system so our dollars are better spent. The friends are willing to work with you to make this happen. In the meantime, for this upcoming fiscal year, we would like to make the following request. We need an increase in capital funding. Um, New York City Parks needs a much larger capital budget to implement infrastructure improvements as needed. Parks shouldn't have to beg elected officials for funding of basic infrastructure projects. They should have their own dedicated capital budget to implement these projects like every other city agency does. Elected officials should only have to provide support for projects that are above and beyond a park's basic needs. Maintenance funding, we strongly believe that New York City Parks is not funded at a level for the agency to properly maintain and care for all its parks. Each year we see funding allocated for capital projects, but we don't see an increase in maintenance funding to keep these new facilities in good shape. Instead, after a few years, they fall into disrepair and need a new capital funding to restore them. It can be avoided with ongoing maintenance. The budget should allocate more money for dedicated maintenance staff, PEP officers, and other staff for the park. And then specifically for our park, I do have to say this every time, Daylighting Tibbetsbrook. <laughs> we need funding for phase one of the project, which involves wetland restoration within Van Cortland Park to begin decreasing the amount of brook water entering the city's sewer system. Funding is also needed to purchase the CSX property to implement phase two true daylighting. Daylighting Tibbetsbrook has been a potential project for 20 years, and it's time to make it happen. This project shouldn't only involve New York City parks, but we need New York City DEP to participate as they will directly benefit from daylighting Tibbetsbrook. The Friends of Van Cortland Park fully support New York City Parks in its efforts to maintain and improve all of parks in New York City. It's important to the future of our borough that we fund our parks. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, it would be my pleasure with, with Councilman Cohen and yourself to take a tour. I've toured the golf course many times there, but <laughs> I we'll know- I'll show you the a, rest of the park. <laughs> I, very, no mulligans. It's a very large park, and I would love to see it. Um, I have some plans already, but uh, we'll 
we will have a Bronx Day or days as is necessary. So I look forward to that seeing you That would be great. There. Love to have you there. Um, Ms. Argenti? Hi. I'm going to speak in general about parks and budget. Um, budgets are not just numbers. Good budgeting involves planning and managing. The idea of management by budget requires identifying a policy, looking for funds, and, and balancing the match. The City Council has the responsibility to review the entire budget, not just the Parks Department. What do we want for our city? What would make it a safe and happy place? Fully staffed and funded parks, programs, and facilities. I've researched uh, very quickly a whole bunch of different uh, things that parks are good for. They help increase your health, your social connection, aid in the environment. They give you a positive impact on the local economy. They take care of the stormwater collection. They reduce the heat, the heat island effect. They are the center of your community. They help mental health boost. They're a place for kids to be outside, a place for physical activity, a natural systems. Um, we could just go on. There's a great uh, web page called Healthy Parks, Healthy People, and they talk about how open space and parks is great for, is associated with perceived general health, reducing stress levels, reducing depression, and more. Uh, people who use public open spaces are three times more likely to achieve recommended levels of physical activity than those who do not use the spaces. Urban parks also contribute to environmental benefits, um, and obviously those kinds of things would have to be paid for by, not by parks department, by through the general budget. Parks also help create human and energy efficient cities that can help slow global warming. Every tree helps fight global warming and helps cool cities. In the United States, an evaluation of the largest 85 cities in the country, about 57 million people, found that the health savings from parks was an estimated $3 billion. The environmental savings are significant as well. Trees and vegetation in urban parks often lower costs. Natural solutions for addressing stormwater runoff and air pollution. In Philadelphia alone, they saved $16 million as a result of stormwater management, which, by the way, we're not doing in our city. Um, and then finally, um, here, this is a very nice quote that I found. Stressful, successful public places around the world are successful, not just because of the design, but because of the management. That's not just cutting the grass and picking up the garbage. The bigger part of management is how to involve the community in the parks. We need to think of parks more as outdoor community centers where we need to invest in and uses and activities so they can fulfill their potential. When we improve parks, we really are improving quality of life. Um, to sum up, giving more money to parks, and in particular maintenance and operations, can work towards lowering costs in expense budget areas, such as the administration of justice, public health, social services, you can do it. The City Council could do that. We're working on that. I thank you for being here today to encourage us. Um, it's critical. Our parks are so many different things to so many different people. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Spalter. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the park's budget. I begin my testimony with what I learned at last month's Bronx Park Speak Up from guest speaker Charles McKinney, Principal Urban Designer for New York City Parks from 2010 to 2016. He offered simple ways the New York City Council and mayoral offices could fix the system to speed up projects, lower costs, and avert major capital projects. I have attached his bio and speech aptly named, We Can Fix That. Uh, here are some suggestions. One, replace the $400 million capital budget that Parks forfeited in the 1990 budget crisis. This was used to fund state of good repair projects, such as roofs, boilers, retaining walls, 
and playgrounds. They required commissioner approval and not design commission approval. The department had the funding to cover change orders without asking elected officials to do it. Number two, bring back the modest expense budget that funded dedicated in-house maintenance crews to avert large capital projects. By way of example, he used St. Nicholas Park in northern Manhattan. The stairs that were restored in early 2000 are shifting due to the lack of masonry pointing. Yet, two people and a couple of helpers to point and reset would avert deterioration resulting in yet another expensive capital project. Three, reinstate the requirement that all capital project contractors obtain a completion bond. Changes have made it possible for undercapitalized contractors to take on projects and fail, such as the skate park in Van Cortlandt Park. Now the mess is left for parks to fix, to obtain OMB and Corporation Council approval, rebid, and register a new contract with the controller and on and on, delays. In addition, I have submitted a report commissioned in 2014 by New Yorkers for Parks, done for members of the City Council. It provides 15 clear, actionable steps to improve the on-time and on-budget performance of DPR's capital project. We all agree that the premise that steps must, we all agree with the premise that steps must be taken to reduce bureaucracy and improve the on-time and cost of park capital projects. However, it is shocking that Resolution 0038-218 to amend the city charter in order to create the Parks Construction Authority has been introduced in the Council without exploring better alternatives. Clearly, there are far better, less expensive alternatives to creating a new, totally unaccountable public benefit corporation. I urge you to explore all of them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I going to be uh, looking at that resolution. Um, I'm not sure it's a bad idea. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but we need to do something, and we will be holding hearings, and I invite you all to come back at that time uh, to discuss the capital budget. Excellent. We'll be happy to hear any suggestions you may have. I thank you for your testimony, and I'm going to call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, Loretta Watson, Friends of Moshula Parkland, Paulette Spencer, the Bronx Community Health Network, and Brett Dakin, Jacob Schiff Playground. Ms. Watson? Good afternoon.
make trails safer to walk on. We cannot put up a yellow flashing light for mid-crossing. We cannot fix park sidewalk or broken pathways. We cannot control the flooding. As a volunteer friends group, we can share with you why we need an increase in parks funding. We can share with you our frustration. We can share with you that our community has been rezoned set so that affordable housing can be developed. And guess what? They have built, keep building, and will continue to build. We can share with you that we are here asking for that increase in funding so that parkland like ours continue to serve those that are already here and those that are coming. I leave you today with the folder handout. The left side of the folder being the issues of Mashula Parkland and the right side are all the great presented ideas to the public shared in the many community meetings. But how can we vote on something when there is no money for it? So I thank you for allowing me to testify. And thank you, you for your thank you for your testimony. It is important. Um, every voice that we have, and obviously uh, the friends group is a large voice, is important, and uh, it, it does not go unheard. I have the honor of being chair of this parks committee, but I can assure you that every single member of the council is very interested in what goes on in not only their individual parks, but parks throughout the city of New York. So thank you for being yes. with us today. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Spencer. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paulette Spencer. I am the Community Engagement and Policy Analyst for the Bronx Community Health Network, which is a federally funded health center and nonprofit community-based organization that assures access to quality, affordable, primary, preventive medical care and support for social services for, to residents regardless of their ability to pay or immigration status. My program, which is called the Bronx Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health CHAMPS, is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Leach's goal is to reduce obesity in communities like the Northeast Bronx where obesity rates are disproportionately high through initiatives supporting healthy nutrition and increased physical activity. Over the past three years, our Bronx Reach CHAMPS 34 member coalition of individuals local community groups, and parks friends organizations, and agencies including the New York City Parks Department, policymakers, all committed to making our parks safe, welcoming, and accessible for community use through walking, running, and other fitness services um, in seven central and northeast Bronx parks. To date, our coalition and community-led parks-based activities have become available to more than 300,000 community residents. One coalition partner, New Yorkers for Parks, created a set of seven park visitor guides in both English and Spanish that have been widely distributed to community residents. These guides have also received high praise from the CDC. Uh, New Yorkers for Parks has also created a research tool called Soul Park that measures park usage and can be, whose data can be used to enhance parks programming. And so therefore, with enhanced parks programming and increased access to parks, our coalition can eventually measure the long-term change in the health statistics in the surrounding communities and examine the extent to which park usage and improved access to parks are related to improving a community's health. We would appreciate learning how BCHN and the City Council Committee can work together to support and sustain expansion of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, Mr. Dakin, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. That's right, thanks. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the New York City Council Committee on Parks and Recreation. I'm Brett Dakin, a volunteer with the Jacob Schiff Playground Neighborhood Association. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The association is a group of volunteers supporting Jacob Schiff Playground, a park of about four acres in Hamilton Heights, Manhattan. We are located in District 7, and we thank Council Member Mark Levine for his support for our efforts to improve our park and enhance the quality of life in the neighborhood. 
We work closely with the Department of Parks and Recreation and Partnerships for Parks to help bring sorely needed maintenance, horticulture, and programming to the playground and the surrounding blocks. The last capital investment of any kind in our park occurred nearly 20 years ago. We strongly support the Parks Equity Initiative. We have benefited from the City Parks Foundation's programming in smaller neighborhood parks like ours, as well as its technical assistance through Partnerships for Parks. Increased funding for these efforts is required to help historically underserved parks like ours. We also strongly support the Community Parks Initiative, or CPI. While the city parks system may have improved in recent years, these improvements are yet to be felt equally throughout the city. As you know, parks in low and moderate income neighborhoods like ours are generally less well maintained than parks in wealthier neighborhoods. CPI funds are needed to help parks like ours that have seen limited capital investment and maintenance over the past 20 years. As supporters of Jacob Schiff Playground, a park that last saw capital investment in the year 2000, we strongly support CPI and efforts to achieve equity across all of the city's parks. Thank you so much for your work in support of our parks and for your attention today. Thank you very much for testifying. Uh, every park is important to us, and I appreciate your efforts um, for the people that use Jacob Schiff Playground. Thank you very much. Uh, drum roll, we have our last panel, and that is Rosalind Barbour. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Barber? Oh, please come up from the Public Theater. We have Daisy Ben, who is the president of Local 1505, District Council 37. That's Dilsey. Dilsey, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have taken my glasses off earlier. And Joe Puleo, who is the president of Local 983 of District Council 37. The representative of the Public Theater, before I mangle your name again, why don't you start? <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Rosalind Barber. I'm the Administrative Chief of Staff at the Public Theater. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the uh, Council Member uh, Rodenchuk and Council Ooh, Member Gibson. <laughs> Sorry, thank you for holding today's hearing. Um, conceived nearly 60 years ago as one of the nation's first nonprofit theaters, the public engages in one of the largest and most diverse audiences in New York City in a variety of venues, including the Delacorte Theater and its landmark downtown home, which houses five theaters and Joe's Pub. Last year, through all of our programs, we offered more than 1,600 performances and welcomed over 350,000 people, many of whom acquired tickets to our free and low-cost ticket initiatives, including free Shakespeare in the Park, access through the line in Central Park, our online lottery and distribution sites in all five boroughs, as well as our free mobile unit performances in all five boroughs and at the public, IDNYC, and free first previews. Since 1962, the Delcourt Theater, a city-owned structure in Central Park, has been home to free Shakespeare in the park. Uh, the Public Theater is very proud to steward this facility through a license agreement with the Parks Department, which was renewed in 2013. Since 1962, over five million people have attended performances for free at the Delcourt Theater. Each year we welcome about 100,000 attendees, and in 2017, we welcomed audience members from every zip code in New York City. Productions have ranged from Shakespeare to a revival of Hair, the American Tribal Love Rock musical. Each summer, we produce two five-week productions and a 200-person public works civic pageant with community participants performing an original musical adaptation of Shakespeare. Access and equity are key values of Free Shakespeare in the Park, and in each year, we partner across the city with borough leaders, community centers, libraries, and service organizations to ensure we offer free tickets as broadly, diversely, and equitably throughout the city as possible. This year, we are seeking city council uh, funding to support a capital request to address the Delacorte Theater's crumbling infrastructure and many years of deferred maintenance. The facility is in need of significant renovations in, or, in order to serve the next generation of New Yorkers and continue to provide the highest quality cultural experiences for free to the public, which is why we've proposed a public-private partnership to address the facility's capital needs. In addition to our work in Central Park, our mov mobile unit tours Shakespearean productions for underserved audiences throughout the New York City's five boroughs twice per year. 
In all, we visit 18 to 20 venues per tour, including five New York City parks venues, seven correctional facilities, two facilities that provide services for the homeless, and three community-based organizations with whom we partner through our public works program. We're proud to partner with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation in selecting our performance sites and partner organizations. This spring, we are bringing our mobile unit production of Henry V to five New York City Parks venues, including the Roy Wilkins Recreation Center, Brownsville Recreation Center, the Williams Bridge Oval Recreation Center, and Pelton Fritz Recreation Center, as well as the Faber Field House. We're particularly excited that in this production, uh, Henry will be played by a woman of color, uh, Zenzi Williams. Thank you so much for your time and for letting us talk a little bit about how much we enjoy partnering with the Parks Department and serving all five boroughs. I know you've told me. I'm scared to ask how much it's going to cost to rebuild the Delacorte <laughs> Theater, but I... Uh, so uh, we are still in the process of selecting an architect, um, and uh, I should mention that the commissioners, um, Commissioner Silver and Commissioner Finkelpearl, have decided to take on the project uh, jointly and have it go through the DCLA CCG funding process. Uh, but we expect that the project uh, may cost as much as $100 million, given the site of the uh, project being in Manhattan and in Central Park. It's an expensive project. But the renovation, the building hasn't seen a significant renovation since 1962, and it was built then for about $370,000. So we expect it was not intended to last 55 years without any significant capital investment, um, and we expect that this renovation will set us up for the next 50 years of New Yorkers to enjoy it. I've been to Roman amphitheaters in Egypt and Israel and other parts of the world. They lasted 2,000 years, and I'm sure they, they got their money's worth. Yes, um, they definitely did. <laughs> well, I, um, that's a lot of money, but um, this is New York. And, we're at, and I think that we're very, we recognize that, which is why we've offered to make this a public-private partnership, despite the fact that we operate it through a license agreement with the city. My understanding is that you're not asking the city for the whole $100 million. Correct. We're actually uh, asking for less than half. Less than half. Yeah. All right. I thank you for your testimony right. and um, look forward to working with you. Yeah. Um, I think the next two people don't need $100 million, but <laughs> it remains to be seen. Uh, Ms. Ben, president of Local 1505, if you'd All right. Good afternoon. You guys are the workforce. Yes. <laughs> it's a good way to end the program. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and fellow Parks um, Committee members. My name is Dulce Ben. I'm the president of Local 1505, representing city park workers and the New York City Parks and Recreation Department. My members work at all five boroughs conducting maintenance and operations in all, in all the city parks. I want to start out by thanking the council for additional funding in the fiscal year 2018 um, for the Parks Department. This funding was used to maintain the city funded lines for 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners. Parks has over um, 3,900 acres of land, 39,000, I'm sorry, acres of land, um, meaning that one gardener is responsible for maintaining an average of 254 acres of parkland. The Department of Parks and Recreation is wholly um, underfunded, and we request your support in making our communities and those underserved parks and our communities more beautiful. Since the 2018 additional funding has not been baseline for fiscal year 19, I'm urging the council to restore, the, the, in, in, to restore and increase the funding. And this funding, if this funding is not restored, these workers will be laid off, resulting in not having enough workers in the, in, in the city park workers and gardener titles to perform the duties I stated above. Furthermore, the maintenance and under upkeep of the park will suffer, leading to blight and neighborhood decay. As the, min as the minimum wage in the New York City um, state increases to $15 an hour this year, and my members make $15.48 to start, it's becoming increasingly difficult to live in the city. The city must take a long, hard, wholesome look at how it can take, care more, take better care of its workforce. As we approach the start of the spring season in the next several weeks, there's a lot of work to be done. 
to prepare the parks for the thousands of New Yorkers who will be taking strolls and enjoying the warmer weathers in the, in, in the parks. The beautification of parks is very important to all New Yorkers, as well as to thousands of tourists who visit these areas each year. Once again, I'm urging the council to restore the additional funding in the fiscal year 19 for the um, city park workers and the garden alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. I want to thank you for being here today, and I, I um, certainly, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the expense budget, this is our top priority uh, for the council that we restore funding for these 150 workers, and um, they're certainly not paid enough for sure, and I know the work that they do. I see them out there every day. Um, I have large parks right near my house. The depot for Cunningham Park is less than a mile away from my home. Yes, yeah, a I, very I, big park. I pass it quite often, and um, I know the work that, that your members do and uh, how well they performed um, in the recent uh, emergency that we had in our parks uh, where many, many trees came down, some of which will never be cut up because they're in the forever wild sections, but um, we suffered greatly in Queens, um, especially in my district. So thank you for your work. And um, with that, we have our last testifier of the day, Mr. Paleo, who is the president of Local 983. Correct. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman. Rodinchik, am I pronouncing it correctly? Uh, Rodinchik? Okay. It's, it goes with the truth. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, congratulations, they spell, by it, they spell it correctly on my paycheck. Okay, That's so. Really um, That's all that matters. And, congratu <laughs> and congratulations on your, on your new position. And fellow park committee members, my name is Joseph Pooley. I am the president of Local 983, representing Urban Park Rangers and Associated Urban Park Rangers, collectively, collectively referred to, uh, to as PEP officers. In addition, I also represent city seasonal aides and associate park service workers who are responsible for providing skilled work for super and supervising city park workers and city seasonal aides within New York City uh, parks recreations. My members work in all five boroughs conducting enforcement and maintaining in all New York City parks, playgrounds, beaches, and pools. I want to start off by uh, thanking the city council for the additional funding in FY 2018 for uh, the parks department. This funding was used to maintain the CSA uh, PEP funding lines and increase in park security. This allowed for additional allocation of parks, police, and increased activity in New York City in over 39,000 acres of parkland. The Department of Parks and Recreation has, woefully under, has been woefully underfunded as it, as it comes to parks enforcement, with only around 290 park officers. An AUPR in um, an eight-hour shift is responsible for securing and maintaining safety for 45 acres of parkland. We need additional funding to increase manpower of PEP officers so we can maintain our safety in parks, you know, like Flushing Meadow Parks, Juniper Valley, Forest Hills, and other throughout the city of New York. Local 93 requests, uh, uh, Local 93 requests our support in making our communities and those underserved parks in our communities safe and beautiful by providing adequate funding for our CSA, APSW, and PEP lines. I'm urging City Council to restore and increase funding by adding new lines in our park uh, uh, enforcement officers, CSAs, and continue to provide funding for the necess uh, necessary to reduce inequity in our parks, resources, in all five boroughs as it comes to both uh, security and maintenance. As we approach the start of spring in the next several weeks, there is a lot of work to be done to prepare for parks for thousands of New Yorkers. Actually, I think it's millions that will be uh, taking strolls and enjoying the warmer weather in parks. The beautification of parks is important to all New Yorkers, as well as the thousands, I say millions of tourists who visit these areas. Once again, I am urging City Council to look seriously into increasing funding so that we can continue to maintain security for our residents and for those who visit our fair city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. The answer is probably 100 million people. I don't know uh, what the, the real answer is, but in Central Park alone, we have about 40 million. Uh, yeah, visitors. I just want to further state that um, I think we're on the right track. Uh, I think this administration uh, has been doing uh, the right thing. I just feel that we haven't met our goals yet. Um, at one time, for example, in the early 90s, we had 450 uh, PEP officers 
Uh, we're not quite there yet. We're up to almost 300. Those numbers obviously have to increase if you want to provide, you know, the level of safety that people, you know, uh, require at a minimum. And uh, we also, you know, we need more uh, city seasonal aids. A lot of them come through the welfare to work program. We, we want to see that they get real jobs and not go through the cycle again, go back on welfare and go through the program. So, um, you know, respectfully, we, you know, we need hundreds of those, you know, uh, and we need urban park rangers to go out there like we once had and uh, teach children about the ecology in parks. A lot of what they do is preventive. You know, it's hard to measure what they do, but uh, ultimately, you know, they make the parks, you know, a pleasurable place and they, re you know, respect others that are in the parks. Well, um, after we wrestle the capital thing to the ground, my, other, my next number one priority, I have two number one priorities, if you can have that, is to increase funding overall for our parks. And there was a time, a long time ago, uh, when the funding for parks was closer to 1% of the city budget. If that were true today, it would be about $880 million, and which would be a very, very substantial increase in parks funding. Um, we probably won't get to that point anytime soon, to be quite blunt, but we could ramp things up over years. Um, it takes time. Even if I wrote a check today for $100 million, it would take time to hire people and to, to do the things that we need to do because we want to do them correctly. But that will continue to be my goal over the next four years of, as Parks Chair. I know uh, Ms. Gibson and all of my colleagues share that goal um, because we know uh, that our constituents, ourselves included, we love our parks. I'm, I'm in them all the time. I'm a user, um, and uh, we just love them. And, I, you know, it's, it's, there's a focus on parks more than anything else because probably um, along with our libraries, although I'll say this as parks chair, they're sexier than our libraries <laughs> um, and because they have more uses, um, there's no question. And they mean uh, different things to different people, and... You know, it's, it's somebody who might be 90, he plays bocce every day when it's warm enough and even when it's not warm enough, he goes to his local park. I can see those guys in Juniper Valley Park or in Moore Park in Corona or in Cunningham Park or in so many other parks um, in the city of New York. I can see the young kids running around um, in the spray showers. I can, you know, remember my youth playing baseball and softball and football and, um, and now it's so many different things. Um, and now I have to play golf because I'm old. But uh, I thank you for your work. I thank you for testifying today. And I thank everybody who attended this hearing. Ms. Gibson, anything else? No, thank you. Okay, so with that, Thank I you all for coming. And I do want to take the opportunity, since she's still here, to acknowledge the Bronx Parks Commissioner. Thank you so much. Today. You got a lot of kudos. And, and really to the workforce, I mean, you are the ones that maintain and keep our parks going, and you are the, the bread and butter of our parks, and we have to do more work to support um, the workforce there. So I thank you all. Thank you all for coming today. Okay. Thank you to my chair for convening today's hearing, and we look forward to working with all of you as we get to the executive budget. Thank you. Thank you. With thank that, you. we are adjourned. Okay.